You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Josh Lee Kwai. And I'm your other host, Rachel Weeks. Rachel, we have a pretty cool topic today. I love this topic because I I love building this way. Today we're talking about Commander Staples, the cards you know, you love, that we talk about a lot, perhaps, that, you know what, might not be worth a price tag. Yeah, it's about bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. There are going to be, doubtless, some cards on this list that you... Strongly disagree with us about, but that's okay. Yeah. I think there are a lot of cards that are played all, very often that are not worth the price tag. It's fine. Yeah. You know, they are good, and you probably, if you already have it, would play it, but I would not buy this card to put in a deck. It's At probably... price tag. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you're going to have to... Yeah, a caveat. These are powerful cards. They're all we good know. cards. We know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good cards. Before we get into the specifics of what these cards are, mm. well, if you're going <laughs> to... You know what's probably going to happen? We're going to talk about these cards and the people are going to want to buy them. I know. Uh, but if you want to buy these or the cards, we all often will talk about alternate cards that will fill the same slot that are much cheaper. Yeah. If you want to find either side of that, cardkingdom.com slash command is the place to go to get all your magic products, singles, anything at all. If you want... To build an entire deck, Card Kingdom has a huge inventory. They're going to not only have the cards you're looking for, but also the specific versions mm -hmm. of the cards that you're looking for. And the great thing is when you add a whole bunch of cards to your cart, you know, somewhere around 60 to 63, let's say, for an entire mm -hmm. commander deck, that generally tends to be how I do it. I don't know about you, Rachel, yeah. but I'll brew the entire deck. Oh, yeah. Put all the cards into a cart. And yes, I already own some of them, but I won't, don't want to have to go look for them. <laughs> no, I never and, check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe some of the cards on this list I would check because they're expensive. Expensive. But the other ones, you know, and I, I'm just like, boom. That's what I love about Card Kingdom because I go click and then the entirety of my cart is going to be handled by one company that's going to mm -hmm. package it all together and send it to my uh, mailing address and I'm going to get it as fast as possible. I'm going to open it up and now I have the entirety of my deck right in my hand right there from one package. Yeah, you can get sleeving. But what are you going to put those the, what sleeves are you going to put those cards in? Yeah, Josh? once I get the cards from cardkingdom.com slash command, where am I going to go after that? Why? Ultrapro.com slash command. Uh, they have all of of the high quality magic accessories that you need to protect your collection and your decks and to travel with them and organize them. They've got everything you need. Uh, Ultra Pro has some of my favorite deck boxes and sleeves and play mats and card sorters and dice. Dice and I particularly love their dice. I, I, think, I agree. I think they've gone pretty simple as far as there's a nice array of colors, but mm -hmm. the numbers are nice and big. They're really good for spell table or when we're doing games, uh, uh, gameplay videos or game nights live or even just playing in person. You never have to be like, uh, how many of those are there? It's like the three yeah. is pretty big and easy to see. For sure. And I'm a huge proponent of when you're playing commander, make sure you're you have a very clear board state because it's very hard to play commander already. Let's <laughs> know what's on your board. And Ultra Pro makes that super easy. So go to oldpro.com slash command to have a cool board state and also a clear one. Yeah. Cool and clear. Cool I like and that. clear. You know who else is cool? This next patron? All, our patrons in general are oh, all, all of cool. Them. Yeah, all of them as a group <laughs> are cool. Uh, Patreon.com slash command zone is the place to go to join our community. Mm -hmm. You can hang out on our Discord, talk with Rachel, myself, Jimmy, all of our team. We're on there all the time. You, We even have uh, spell table games that we play. And then, of course, you get all kinds of other perks like getting extra turns and game nights, uh, access early than the general public. You get to watch them early. And, of course, we shout out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to... Adam Shepard. Adam? You rock. You definitely rock. All right. Extra let's get into cool. the main topic here. Commander staples that aren't worth the price. Wow, what a provocative title. Oh, yes, we did it. <laughs> For the algorithm, we did it. No, <laughs> I think this is very valuable because commander is so expensive. You're buying so many cards. And especially like if you buy a staple, you don't want to buy it. Like I don't want to buy three Cyclonic yeah. Rifts. I don't want to buy like these crazy expensive cards over and over and over again. So sometimes like I just won't. I'll replace them with something that's as good or maybe like slightly better or slightly worse, excuse me. Because a lot of the cards that we're going to talk about are very powerful cards and they're expensive because they were the absolute best version of this effect. But we're playing commander, we're playing casually, we're playing with a lot of versions of this anyway. It really doesn't matter if you have the number one best version of the effect. You can play with second best and it will do just, just as well without paying 50 60 for it you know yeah a lot of the second and third best versions are 
not you know one or two percentage points worse than the number one right. version, but they cost one fifth or one twentieth right. of what the one like 20, the other one does. Thirty dollars less in some cases, and it's one card out of a hundred cards in your deck. Mm-hmm. So the fact that it is at that slot one percent worse is not noticeable to almost every player. Maybe in like a right. CEDH tournament or something, right. being the one exception. If you're Reed Duke or something, that's the exception. But you're not Reed Duke. Yeah. I hate to, you know, I'm sorry, spoiler alert. You He's out the there. champ. Yeah, you probably aren't. You're also the champ. Yeah. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert. Again. Uh, um, but I, I think the negligible difference in power level is often hard to calculate. And so, oh, I'm going to spend $50 on a card when there's a $2 version that's very, very close. And by very close, right. I mean 99% as good in right. almost all scenarios or n- even 95. And that doesn't make your deck any less powerful overall. Like a supercomputer could barely calculate the difference in your deck. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting thing that's going to come up here as we mm-hmm. talk about the alternatives. The other thing I think that happens and we're... Um, one of the primary offenders of it, which is that when talking about commander cards and commander staples and just commander in general, pundits such as ourselves Mm -hmm. will often sort of default to one card that sort of is emblematic of, you know, a certain kind of effect. So we'll say Crater of Behemoth a lot, right? Because that's the first card that comes to mind when we're talking about that effect. But what is that effect? That effect is just say, if you have a lot of creatures, now I need a card that converts having a lot of creatures that can attack into winning the game. Mm-hmm. And Craterhoof is just the card that is the default card that we right. reference in that situation. And so if you're new to the format, or even if you're not, you start to think like, well, Craterhoof Behemoth is the only card or the far and away the best one I need to use because that's the one they call out all the time when really there is a slew of cards that can fill that slot and do mm-hmm. basically exactly the same thing. And there's often not a need to spend the high price tag on the one. Yeah. Um, so I think that's part of the problem too. So, yeah. you know, I apologize for that, but that is how you talk about things. Right. And, you know, obviously going to continue. <laughs> the, the other side of that coin is some of these cards are expensive because they're huge in other formats. Mm. Um, so they're, they show up in legacy or modern deck. So they're expensive because that format needs that card. Oh yeah, yeah. And they may not necessarily be worth that price tag in commander. It's not warranted in a commander deck. It's right. warranted in a modern deck. In a right? modern deck. Yeah. So that price is driven by other formats. So that, that has come up uh, in a couple of these. That's interesting as well. Okay. All right. So all the pregame talk out of the way. Yes. Let's start with the actual cards. What is the first card? And these are in alphabetical order? They're in alphabetical. So they're not in order of highest offenders? No, no, no. (laughs) But these are cards that show up really high on EDA Trek. So I went went on the EDA Trek list of staples and I pulled cards that were... High had high price tags that I was like, you know what, probably are replaceable. Yeah. And this first one, I think, is a great illustration of that. It's Avison Angel of Hope, which is currently clocking in at $50. This is a very cool card. And, yes. And, you know, especially when you're newer, you look at this and you're like, holy crap. Yeah, it's I as, need that. It says other permanents are indestructible. Yeah, it's five white, white, white for an 8-8 eight, eight flying vigilance. It is indestructible. It's a legendary creature. But it says other permanents you control. Have indestructible. Have indestructible. So it's indestructible, and it makes everything you have How indestructible. How do you beat that? <laughs> it's, you read it, and you're like, yes, I need that. Yeah. <laughs> and the answer is Swords to Blast Shares. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anguish done making, Chaos Warp, Capsize, like, yeah. Cyclonic Rift, Toxic Deluge. So uh, we've talked about this a lot lately because of the Dominus cycle, but indestructible just isn't what it used to be. Indestructible protects you from about half the removal and about half half the board wipes that are very common in Commander. So, like, all of your stuff being indestructible means that 50% of the time, you're okay. Which is is okay. It's like, it's still a thing that's nice. It's good. But is it $50 good? Yeah, $50 on an 8-drop, too. Yeah, so... I was looking at, like, there's a lot of cheaper ways to replace this. And there's sort of two reasons that you would run an Avacyn in your deck. And it's that you want the board protection... Which is, there's lots of alternatives to that. Or you want a big, scary angel. And there are lots of cheaper replacements for that. So um, I think on the indestructible side, if you're like, you know what? Indestructible works really well in my playgroup. I want to make sure I have access to indestructibility. Something like a selfless spirit will go as far as an Avacyn a lot of the time. So this is a two drop with flying. It has an activated ability that says sacrifice a selfless spirit creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. Most of the time, the indestructibility for everything only matters in the case of a board wipe. So that one off is 
just as good most of the time as indestructible all the time. Uh, Linval, a shield of the Seagate, mm-hmm. does a similar thing. Gives all of your creatures indestructible or, and hexproof for one one turn. Mm-hmm. Now, this stuff is only your creatures, whereas Avacyn yeah. is all your stuff. Right. So, I think there's a little bit of a difference there, but mm-hmm. at the same time, these things are actually going to be more reliable at protecting you because they can come out earlier. Mm-hmm. Whereas Avacyn, one of the reasons I think it's not worth $50 is because it's an 8-drop and the fact that, like, even if you have it in your hand, it won't save you from damnation because a lot of times they're casting damnation before you yeah. could have got Avacyn out on the board. Absolutely. So you'll be stared at me like, it would have been sweet if my creatures had indestructible. I only have six mana anyway. Yeah, or if you had one of these one of these cheaper things like Selfless Spirit or Grand Crescendo is a cool new one that they printed. Um, it either makes tokens and then it gives creatures you control indestructible until end of turn. The, these things will protect your board now where Avacyn doesn't protect your board until turn, you know, six maybe. And um, uh, I like Grand Crescendo a lot as mm-hmm. a, a much better version of what Avacyn is doing because it's an instant. Mm-hmm. So if you have Avacyn out and they have Damnation in hand, I'm just going to use Damnation as yeah. what I was complaining about earlier. Uh-huh. The, the, you know, standing in for all those type of effects. Yeah. Um, they're not going to cast Damnation because they see the Avacyn. They're, right. You know, they see it. It's very hard to trick someone with an eight mana creature. Right. <laughs> it's so hard to flash it out. So they'll wait until they have sort of plowshares or somebody gets rid of the Avacyn and then cast the damnation. Mm-hmm. Whereas Grand Crescendo, you can get them because mm-hmm. they think they've got you. And nope. You're you like they're trick. they're like austere command and you're like, cool, Grand Crescendo. And they didn't know you had that. Yeah. Yeah. So I like I like that as a a much better version of protection. Right. And like I've seen a lot of people run Avacyn on the other end as not just board protection, but as like a big scary threat, Mm -hmm. like as a finisher in white decks. And it's a very expensive card, but at the end of the day, it's an eight mana vigilance with indestructible. And that's not like there's a, that's a very replaceable kind of threat. White has a lot of really good ones, including Sarah's Emissary, which is a amazing card. It's a very powerful card. Almost certainly better. Yeah. Sarah's Emissary is a $3 and 50 cents. Uh, and it's, it's a seven yeah. seven flyer for a four white white white. As it enters the battlefield, you choose a card type. You and creatures you control have protection from the chosen card type. Often you choose creature. Usually creatures. Yeah, you can't be damaged. Can't creatures be can't be blocked. You yeah. can't like you can block infinitely. Like this is a very this is a three dollar card. <laughs> this card is really good and will win you games because you yeah. just play it and then attack and then you win. Right. If you make a copy of it, now you have protections from creatures and instants. It's like very difficult to get through a Sarah's Emissary. If you're looking for just another like big beater, I still like a Chroma, uh, a Chroma Angel of Wrath. It's a 6-6 with flying, first strike, vigilance, trample, haste, protection from black and from red. Like that's as that's a much bigger threat in the air. It's faster and it like people forget about it because you're just like, oh, you know, it's an Chroma. It'll be fine. Right. Uh, you've got Safara, Skies, Blade, and a Chroma... The other one, Vision of Ixidor. Actually, there's a lot of other Akromas. Yeah, I was going to say this is your list. Game Nights Akroma. <laughs> yeah, though. this is Game Nights Akroma. This this is a finisher. Yeah, it is a seven mana angel. It says at the beginning of each combat until the end of turn, each other creature you control gets plus one plus one. If it has a whole bunch of creature uh, key keywords, any key, yeah, for whatever keyword it's got, it gets more and bigger and bigger. So it's it buffs your whole board. This this Akroma will end the game, whereas the other Avacyn will sort of prolong the game. Right, in my opinion. I think there's probably a lot of people out there and they're going to say this throughout this episode, which is like, but my Avacyn d- is so good in my Kalia deck. Sure. Or yeah. it's so good in X deck. And I think with certain synergies, right. Avacyn, we're not saying it's unplayable, right? Yeah. It's just not worth $50. And if you don't own an Avacyn right now, even if you have a Kalia deck, I would say $50 is better spent in a lot of other places. And another reason which we haven't talked about yet is because it's five white, white, white. Mm. And this, there's only certain decks First of all, only white decks, only decks with white could run it, right? Yeah. So you take your Kalia deck apart or, you know, you, whatever, build a new deck. Even if it has white in it, let's say there's only five white cards and only seven white, you know, maybe 10 white sources in mm-hmm. the deck. You might be hesitant probably to play a card that has white, white, white in its cost if it's not a heavy, heavily white deck. And so it's just a very narrow card. Whereas let's say Avacyn was just eight colorless mana. Broken, mm-hmm. first of all. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then I think the price tag is a little more warranted because at least then any deck I own, yeah. I could consider putting a Chroma into that deck because having all my permanents be indestructible, you know, it might not be exactly what my deck is trying to do, but it's going to be good. It's good. In yeah. any deck. Even then, it probably still wouldn't be worth 50 bucks, but at least it would be a better case to be made. Whereas 
this one is very narrow, just having not just be one color, mm -hmm. but so you have to be so devoted to that color in order to really run it. Right. Yeah. It, it's just not, it's just not worth $50. Yeah. Like it, there's, there's a lot of, uh, it's very replaceable at that price tag. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Yeah. We had an interesting discussion, which I'm sure we will rehash here yes. about this card. Cause I do like this card. Yes. Uh, so the next one is burgeoning and burgeoning is kind of coming in at $18 right now, which isn't, the most expensive staple, but this is this is an effect we see a lot of. Uh, it says whenever an opponent plays a land, you may put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. So it gives you extra land drops. It's one green for the enchantment. It's one green. Yeah, it's it's very cheap. It's so it's comparable to exploration, which is currently only twelve dollars. They've reprinted a lot of it. Yeah, exploration is one green for an enchantment. You can put play an additional land on each of your turns. So mm -hmm. the way these are different is. On turn one, you play Exploration, play a land. If you had another one drop, you could play it right then. Mm -hmm. But on turn one, you play Burgeoning. You tap your land, you play Burgeoning. Now mm -hmm. on Rachel's turn, presumably it's turn land. one, she plays a land. You go, yep. cool, I got another land in my hand, I play it. Then it goes to Jimmy's turn, he plays land. You go, cool, I got another land in my hand, I play it. Then it goes to Jake's turn, he says, cool, I play a land. And you go, I'm out of lands, because I only started with a three lander. Mm -hmm. Um but still, I got my lands into play, yep. all of them, right now. And there's that feel-bad moment where you draw the next card for turn, and it almost feels like you missed a land drop, even though you you're still one land more. ahead. Right. But in that scenario, you're exactly where on your turn where you would be with Exploration, right? Right. You you would have had three yep. lands on turn two. Right. In in some like in most cases, it's going to be basically the same as Exploration, right? Because you will run out of lands at some point unless you're doing... Uh, you have a lot of card draw. Unless you have a ton of card draw. Yeah. The thing that I like about exploration more than burgeoning is burgeoning requires that the hand, the lands be in your hand. Yeah. The way you really utilize the multiple land drops is usually by playing lands out of your graveyard with some sort of effect. Right. And burgeoning doesn't give you additional land drops. Yeah. You could also in play it with uh, Course of Crew Fix and things like that, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. You, off the top of your library. Burgeoning requires those lands be in your hand. Yeah. It's kind of like Horn of Greed is weirdly uh, worded so that you, it's not landfall. It has to be played from your it hand has, for it, it to trigger. This is a similar yeah. thing. Yeah. So like burgeoning is a put trigger and or is a is a put ability and won't trigger Horn of Greed. Where this is an additional land drop which will trigger Horn of Greed. Yeah. It's interesting because exploration I think is better in a land focused landfall deck yeah. because it's mm -hmm. going to have crucible of worlds and ramanek expert right. where burgeoning might be better in a card to draw deck a wheel deck something enchantress where, yes enchantress something where you are going to churn through a lot of cards from right. your life so you're going to usually be holding 12 to 15 cards decks right. that i like to play basically sure yeah yeah and in that case burgeoning can feel like fast bond right it can be like you know, after turn one, I've got four lands. And then after turn two, I've got seven. Right. And it's like, yep, I'm not dropping lands every single, you know, I'm not dropping four every single turn anymore. But that advantage is ginormous because mm -hmm. on turn two, you tap for two. On turn two, I tap for seven. And then on turn three, I tap for seven again and you tap for three. And I'm up, you know, about 11 mana or something. No, seven mana on you by turn yeah. three that way. I think that yeah. comes from, I think it comes from a big misunderstanding of the kind of decks that burgeoning is Yeah. Good like, I think burgeoning gets slammed into lands decks a lot of the time, whereas most of the time I would rather have an Oracle of Moldaya or or even an Explore, where it just keeps, like, it keeps lands in my hand, gives me additional land drops, helps me trigger my things, where I'm not necessarily drawing, you know, 15 cards a turn cycle or something like that to really take advantage of getting the lands out of your hand. Yeah, I think exploration is probably a little bit better for its price mm -hmm. in more wider variety of decks. Because right. exploration's still good in your card draw deck. Right, yeah. It is. Definitely. Where burgeoning's not that great in a deck that's not drawing a lot of cards. Right. I think it's more niche than exploration is. So most of the time, if I'm going to spend money on this kind of effect, I would rather spend that money on an expo exploration or an Oracle of Moldiah or uh, even Druid class. I think is oh, a Druid really class is underrated. Is a really yeah. solid, very There's a few of the classes that have cheap. flipped under the radar. Druid class is one dollar, and it does it gives you an additional land drop, and it lets you or you gain life when lands enter, and then yeah, it makes something huge. If you get down to the last one, it's like a mana sink for these yeah. big mana decks. Druid class is very strong um and then i was looking at it and i was like there's a lot of ways to just put additional lands into play on your opponent's turn without spending the money on burgeoning right if you're drawing all of these cards you can use a sakura tribe scout mm. which is like the card is a dollar no yeah. it's, it's two dollars and fifty cents you tap it to put a land card from your hand into play walking right. atlas this is a murph favorite Does this a is a colorless thing. version yeah. two mana for a one one tap it you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield yeah there's a bunch of cards that kind of do that thing right uh land scout sky shroud ranger yeah 
Um, those are obviously a little more susceptible to removal. They cost a little bit more. They don't work the turn you mm-hmm. you play them, but they're way cheaper. These are all one to two dollar cards. Yeah. One's you know, Landmark Scout's twenty five cents. I think burgeoning is an if you have it, great, it's very good. And if you don't have it, make sure you want it. Because I've put burgeoning into a couple of decks and been like, I this is not any better than than any other card. Yeah, burgeoning is a card that you read and you probably see it do something cool one time against you and you right. think this card's insane. Yeah. Because that it has that f- Fast Bond is a banned card in the format yeah, and it can have that reason. feel. But there are many points in time where burgeoning doesn't do that. It just mm-hmm. gets you your three lands into play and you're in the same place you would be after, on exploration on turn three. You stop hitting land drops. You're not drawing enough cards. It's doing nothing. And mm-hmm. it l- literally would have been better to have, you know, a land in the slot for burgeoning, right. <laughs> you know, because yeah. if you just don't have enough velocity in your deck, enough card draw, yeah. yeah for sure. 18 bucks, 18, 18 bucks, bucks is a lot. I can't, you know what I can't believe? Oracle of Moldiah is seven fifty. I, I remember when that was a forty dollar card. I know. I was so <laughs> excited to be able to put it on this list and say that, like, look, you can get an Oracle and it's a reasonable price. Yeah, I was like, that's a cheap alternative. I look, yeah. We begged for that reprint for years, but they did it finally. They did it. <laughs> this next one we have teased a little bit. Yep. It's Craterhoof Behemoth. All right, let me read it. It's another eight mana spell. Five green, green, green for a five, five beast with haste when it enters the battlefield. Creatures you control gain trample and get plus X, plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. In general, if you have about eight creatures or more, you will now win the game Mm because this comes in, becomes your ninth creature, and all your creatures get plus nine, plus nine, and trample. Wah! Nine times nine, I believe, is 81, and that means if they had zero power to begin with, which they didn't, so yeah. it's probably more like 90 or so damage. Yeah. 95 damage, yeah. Normally, when you cast a Crater Hoof, you win the game. But if you can attack and they don't weren't ready for it, yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. I But this is this is an overrun effect. So yeah. plus, plus X, plus X, and Trample is an effect that green does really, really well. And often, you don't have to pay $33 for. Uh, I do want to... I've included a finale of devastation as like a sub option of on this list. A finale is a it's fifty five dollar five dollar card. It's a fifty five dollar card, and if you're using it primarily as like an overrun to cast it where X is ten, which is not always where it's being used. Usually, yeah, it's a it has a like green sunsy in this right uh, uh, effect, effect on, on it. it yeah. yeah, so it like that it plays more double duty than Crater Hoof does, but you can get an overrun effect for like four dollars. <laughs> <laughs> literally overwhelming stampede which is yeah. a sorcery version of crater huff right three green green yeah. sorcery until end of turn creatures you control get trample on plus x plus s where x is the number of or sorry is the greatest power among creatures you control very similar yeah uh if you're in a green deck you often have like a five five or a six six and that's a very reasonable yeah even a token to deck have. it's usually like well what's the power of your commander whatever that is yeah plus x, four plus x. yeah and you're like okay everything gets plus four plus four and trample that's usually enough to win the game right and you're like yes crater hoof does give you plus nine plus nine in that situation but like dead and more dead are the same yeah <laughs> Uh, you put a Craig favorite on here, Triumph yeah. of the Hordes, which is $14. Yeah. It's two green green for a sorcery. Until end of turn, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, trample, and infect. So this is, yeah, effectively the same. Yeah. Often will pump all of your creatures enough to kill multiple players, and you mm-hmm. don't need a lot more power because you only have to hit them for 10 total because of the infect. Right. Yeah. And and Triumph of the Hordes is still relatively pricey. Like fourteen dollars isn't nothing. Yeah. But it is significantly less than the thirty three dollar price tag on Crater Hoof. Yeah. They've also printed a number of things that just give uh, plus three plus three or plus uh, this one's plus two plus two in Trample. I really like Earthshaker Giant in this slot. Earthshaker Giant is only six dollars and it is a six mana six six with Trample that says when it enters the battlefield, other creatures you control get plus three plus three and gain Trample until end of turn. So if you want, if you like that Crater Hoof is on a creature and you, the ETB is the important part of it, that is a replaceable effect for for five or six dollars. A lot of people like Endraise Four Runners for this a similar effect. It's plus two plus two vigilance and trample. So now you still have your defenses up if you can't take them out on that turn. Yeah, I like Earthshaker Giant quite a bit because it is six mana as opposed to eight, eight and that yeah. often matters. Sometimes you're staring at the Crater Hoof and. Uh, I want to do two things here right? because I need to remove the propaganda plus play this thing or whatever. And Earthshaker gives you a couple extra mana to be able to pull off, you know, better sequencing. Yeah. So I, I think like Crater Hoof is a good card, obviously, but this slot can be filled by a lot of popular green cards and you can save yourself 20 bucks and spend it somewhere else. Another card I use a lot in this slot is Beastmaster Ascension. That's a great one. Which is like $3. Yeah. 
It's and, so cheap. Yeah, and it doesn't give trample. No. But I've found that in general, since it gives such a big buff to everything. It's plus five, plus five, right? Yeah. yeah. It, doesn't, it also still doesn't matter because you're like, okay, whatever. I've got 10 things. You can block three of them, but the plus five, plus five means you die right. to the ones that get around mm-hmm. more. And tends to, and you can play it and it's cheap the mm-hmm. turn that you're going to attack with a lot of things and get all the counters on that attack. And right. so, yeah, I tend to use those interchangeably. Triumph of the Hordes, Beastmaster, Ascension, Craterhoof uh, yeah. tend to be like my top three. Right, yeah. And Craterhoof is very expensive, so I use the other two more. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a very replaceable effect. So don't run out run out and snap up a Craterhoof unless you already have one. All right, well, we are just hating on green yeah, because we've is... got our third green card in a, war- a row. And do you think this yeah. one will be controversial? I don't know. <laughs> This card has been reprinted over and over and, and over it's still again. Still hundred dollars. One hundred dollars. When we for a when you when you put this price down, I was like, it's not a hundred dollars, right? They just reprinted it. I feel nope, like it's it is back up to a hundred dollars. It's insane. I mean, even Vorn collects Monstrous Raider, which does effectively the same thing, is a fifty dollar magic card. Yeah. So doubling season is. A very splashy card it has been popular since the moment it was mm-hmm. printed because it's one of those cards that you read it. It's kind of like Avicenna and you're just like, wow. Yeah. I can th- immediately think of a million reasons why this is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it like- double, Yeah, it's an enchantment for five mana that doubles how many plus one plus one counters something would get or how many, sorry, counters of any kind that counters something would get kind. or how many tokens you would make. Um, You're like, and it's Whoa. only you, not your opponents. Yeah. So if a planeswalker comes down, it comes down with double the amount of loyalty. If you would put five plus one plus one counters on everything you control, you're gonna put ten. If, Avenger of Zendikar goes. <laughs> yeah. If you're gonna make a four four angel token, you make two of them. Yep. If you're gonna make two of them, you make four of them. Um, it it is very splashy, and it is just thematically like a commander card, right? Like this it's is so over the top. Yeah. yeah. It is just one of the reasons that this type of effect, one of the reasons why people just play the format, just would be like, yeah, I got to made a lot. Yeah. Did a lot. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Like that's one of the Commander reasons we players, play Commander. We're, we're like, you know, what? I, I can only do 40 damage to kill you, but I want to do 200. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or 20,000. Like it's, yeah. the, the, the numbers just get so crazy, but a hundred dollars. And you know, what's <sighs> crazy. I've started cutting it from quite a few decks. In fact, it's just it's a it's five mana for you to do something better later. It's very hard to play to find a spot to play this anymore. Mm. I find that only super friends decks want it. Right. Um, just for the counters or the tokens alone, it is a, it's too slow. Five mana is a lot now. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's kind of like my Vidalcan Ori, my Vidalcan Ori realization from yeah. you know a recent episode, which is like. It's just really hard to be like, five mana. Pass. And you're like, what did you do? Nothing. Go. Yeah. And they'll go, I'm going to remove that. Yeah. And then I'm going to get on with my turn. Yeah. And now you've done nothing. And it's, I, I like, in most decks that are making counters, I would rather run something like a deep glow skate, oh. which is just ETB, double the counters on one thing. Double it now, though. Double so it I now. Get and it's already here. And it now is the, what is it's an ETB. It's done. I get the benefit. It's yes. not like, hey, play this and then something else. It's I played something before and now I'm getting, right. you know, now I'm doubling what's there. Yeah. Especially for a hundred dollars, like playing a, a a permanent that's five mana and it's sweet and you're excited about it and then have it removed <laughs> and it does nothing. It just doesn't, it just doesn't feel very good. So I, I think there's a lot of cheaper effects that will get you more value out of what you hope your hundred dollar ex- expense. Uh, I, I think this one is so egregious that a lot of these cards are not only cheaper, but also if they were the same price, still better. They'll just do better. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's plus one plus one counters, you're after hardened scales. Yeah. Honestly, let's imagine the yeah. parallel universe mm-hmm. where you're building your plus one plus one counter deck, and price doesn't matter. They were yeah. the same price, and I say you can only have one of these two cards in your plus one plus one counter deck. It's hardened scales or doubling season. It's got, it's got to be hardened hard scales. So it's not even bang for your buck. It's just straight up hardened scales is better in a plus one, plus one counter. It's so deck. cheap. It's one mana. Like it's, I agree with you, but I'm yeah. just saying like, so then why would you even consider $100? Because hardened scales is how much? $4.50. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 
it, it comes down before everything. You start getting value every time a creature happens. I like, and this kind of effect is on a ton of things. Like Corpse Jack Menace says basically the same thing. Winding Constrictor. Even if you if you want to get a little spendy and you're playing a plus one counters deck and you really want a doubling season kind of effect, Branching Evolution does basically the same thing. Twenty three dollars, still one fourth the price. Yes. <laughs> And, and, it, and it's, it's three better. mana. It's three it mana. is literally better. Yeah. yeah. Again, same question. If it was parallel universe, doubling season is only twenty three dollars, but you can only put branching evolution or that in your deck. You're taking branching evolution in your one one. I plus would one, think plus so. One counter yeah. Deck, right. Yeah. If one or more plus one counters would be put on a creature you control, twice that many plus one counters are put on the creature instead. It's just what you want, but for three mana. Yeah, and I think some of the reason doubling season is more expensive is because it is more versatile than hardened scales. Right. It does and tokens. As well. It does tokens as well, and it does like loyalty counters and things like that. Mm. But still, any deck you're building, it doesn't want all of those things. Right. It wants only one of those things, and mm. so yeah, spend four dollars. Don't spend a hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're like, you know what, I like how big doubling season makes my stuff. Get an unnatural growth. That card is seven dollars, and it doubles the power of all their creatures every turn. It's sweet. Uh, if you're playing loyalty counters, there's a similar effects. You can get pure imaginative rascal for six dollars and fifty cents. Evolution Sage is absolutely insane in lo- in way better w- with than, loyalty counters. It is yeah. one dollar. <laughs> Whenever you play a land, proliferate. Yep. Uh, Park Car- the lion. Yeah. Yep. I'd say even like Flux Channeler depends on what colors you're in. But often if you care about loyalty counters, you're not in mono green. You're playing like a five color deck or something like that. Yeah. So lots of replacements for doubling season. Don't go out and spend one. Yeah. In token decks, I don't run doubling season anymore. It just is too slow. I'd rather have, you know, a million other things just like Felidar Retreat or something. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes tokens. Yeah. Having something that doubles what you do and says in a second, it'll be sweet is, is I hesitate to put my decks anymore. All right. Now we are done making fun of green for a second. Are we making fun of? Yeah, I suppose we are. Blue! Now it's time for blue. (laughs) Uh, This next one is a $70 magic card. It's Fierce Guardianship. Ooh, this is the quote-unquote free counterspell from the Commander product a couple years back. It's from the deflecting SWAT yeah. uh, cycle. And it, I would it, say this applies to Force of Will, which is $85, Mana Drain, which is $43, Flusterstorm, which is $33, Swan Song, even, even Swan Song, which is a $15 counterspell. There are, there are I just, was just pining for the days when Swan Song was like $250. I can't believe it's $15. $15. They really need to reprint it. And these are all cheap efficient counter spells that you run because they're as efficient as it gets yeah fierce guardianship in particular is two in a blue for an instance if you control a commander you may cast this spell without paying its mana cost that's the key part and it mm-hmm. says counter target non-creature spell force of will of course is another free counter spell you have to discard a blue card mana drain gives you the mana uh the mana value and colorless mana equal to the spell yeah. you countered that one i think has the best argument for being like it's the most unique of the of the group yeah, and it often leads to... You're going to play a couple times and realize that it actually leads to unfun games because you generally counter something big than have an extremely crazy turn, and now the game's over on turn five. Yeah. Is that what you wanted? <laughs> uh, but power level-wise, you don't necessarily need to spend $70 on Fierce Guardianship because if what you need is a counter spell, there are a ton that are still very efficient and way cheaper. Yeah. I mean, starting with just counterspell. Yeah. Like, blue, blue, the holding up two mana is nothing. It'll counter everything. It just gets the job done, and it's, you know, a dollar. Dollar thirty. Dollar yeah. thirty. Arcane Denial is a Love counterspell it. a lot of people like. It's one in a blue, for an instance. It counters a spell, and then its controller may draw two cards at the beginning of their next upkeep, and you draw one card. I like Arcane Denial. It, it cantrips. It's also a more splashable counterspell. So it's one in a blue versus the blue blue, which can be tricky in three or four color decks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a big fan of Delay. It's uh, two mana for one and a blue. It's counters target spell. And then uh, it suspends it for three turns. So they can't resolve the spell now, but they'll respond. They'll resolve it in three turns, which in Commander is... They're never... It's done. It's, Game's it's, over. You'll yeah. never see it again. Or that spell that you countered three turns from now will not be that impactful anymore. Yeah. Or if it's an X spell, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. I like Delay a lot. Yeah. Uh, there's the new one from uh, New Cabana, which is an offer you can't refuse. Yep. One blue instant. This is kind of the new swan song. Counter target non-creature spell. Its controller creates two treasure tokens. Yep. That one's only $3. And this one was brought to my attention. I haven't actually played this before, but it's Stubborn Denial. Uh, counter target non-creature spell unless its controller plays one. But if you control a creature with power four or greater, counter that spell instead. So it's just a hard counter spell, especially if your commander has four power or greater. Yeah, you could compare it to Fierce Guardianship right. if your commander is four power or greater, right? right? Because it has that. Basically, it says, 
says if your commander's in play, right. now it becomes a pure counter spell. Right. And stubborn denial is what a dollar? It's a yeah. dollar fifty for stubborn denial. And it's only one mana versus fierce guardianships zero. But you know, the difference between seventy dollars and a dollar fifty is is a long way. I do want to pause here though and acknowledge the fact that like Fierce Guardianship is a very powerful card, and you or, can't make that hardened scales versus doubling season argument with mm-hmm. the cards we mentioned as its replacement. There is no world in which, if the cards were worth the same price, you would look at Counterspell and look at Fierce Guardianship and choose Counterspell. Yeah, it is undoubtedly more powerful. And the thing we're weighing here is, but is it seventy dollars? You know, almost seventy times, let's say sixty times more powerful mm-hmm. than Counterspell. If you have a Counterspell on your deck, and in this, then then you have the exact same deck. And it, the only difference is Fierce Guardianship is where Counterspell was. How much more powerful is the Fierce Guardianship deck than the Counterspell deck? Undoubtedly, it is more powerful. Right. How much more powerful? A percentage point? Two? Probably two is even pushing it. Yeah. Because uh, you have the same effect in the same slot, and one requires mana and one doesn't. And I don't want to claim that those things don't matter, but they don't matter as much as you think. And if you are worried about budget right like you don't own every card or whatever like Mm -hmm. none of us do and you know i have a lot of cards and Mm -hmm. you know i have two or three decks that don't have to worry about budget and all the rest still do because i just don't have you know yeah i I have one fierce guardianship yeah exactly my cdh deck and everybody else deals with an arcane denial yeah exactly and the other decks feel fine right they don't they don't you're not sitting there going like i wish i had fierce guardianship in this deck right and it also is the type of card that is in the power level uh column at such a high level that it, it can often feel bad for your opponents because they're like, oh, you got a Fierce Guardianship in your deck. I'm playing on a different level than you are. So right. Free means is so powerful. Even in a, in a game that goes as long as ours, has as many players, free is just like, you can get in a, in a stack fight and you can win because you don't run out of mana. Yeah. You know, it's... It's definitely very powerful. It's very it's, powerful. So this is one of the ones I, I could see people sort of disagreeing with, but 70 bucks is a lot for a single That's card a in your deck. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, does it, yeah, does it make your deck $65 better? And the, the a similar thing to Avacyn, not the exact same, is like, again, this is not a colorless card, so we'll only go in blue decks. Right. And not every deck is, you know, I, I think it does go in a lot of blue decks, and you could almost put it in any blue deck, mm-hmm. unless you had one that was like not going to play its commander out very often. Right. I think that's the only thing I could think of. Um it is going to be good in most of your blue decks. So this yeah. is, this is it's close, but I, I do agree. I wouldn't spend 70 bucks on it. Yeah. It's, um, this is the kind of thing that like these cards that we're listing, these are powerful cards and these are effects that they're going to reprint. So I don't buy this Ooh, kind of card until a reprint comes around and then I keep an eye on prices. Because at some point, like maybe it is worth $30 or maybe it is worth like $35 to you. But 70 is just like such a such a real dent in a lot of people's financial situation that it's like, you just can't. Yeah, you justify. get to the point where like, you're going to get so blown out by a reprint that yeah. you don't, you, it's better to just wait. And $70 is about where Dockside was yeah. sitting before they reprint it. And again, it's going to climb back up. Yeah. Dockside is so powerful that, you know, it was worth it right mm-hmm. when it hit the $35, $40 mark. And now it's already past that again. But and like, yeah, while wait you're for that waiting moment. for the reprint, just run an offer mark. you can't refuse. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that functions exactly the same way. Uh, all right. This next one, we're talking, speaking of big splashy enchantments, this is a fun one. I wish it wasn't $30. It's Fiery Emancipation. Three red, red, red. We should have used that as our background. We have it somewhere. <laughs> Three red, red, red for an enchantment. If a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals triple that damage to that permanent or player instead. They were like, doubling season? Hold my beer. Yeah. <laughs> we're triple it. <Yeah. laughs> this card, I was so annoyed when this card came out. <laughs> Why? Because I was like, triple? Come on. That's dumb. Now we need triple it season. Now we're quadruple it. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cartoonish. Magic in 2042. <laughs> There's going to be quadrupling season and uh, fiery quadruplication. Yeah. Fory, fory. Fiery, fory That's quadruplication. I mean. yeah, yeah, dumb. Uh, <laughs> so this card, this is a $30 card. It is also a six mana enchantment that does absolutely nothing on its own. You have to have a board state for it to be valuable. You have to have a second spell to cast after it, or you have a big attack. It does cool things. 
damage doublers work just fine. <laughs> and they're like, Angras Marauders is a $1.80 <laughs> card, and it is a, a seven mana spell. It's essentially the same. And it says, if a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double, double that damage to that permanent or player instead. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm fine with double. <laughs> I think double does the trick. <laughs> double will will often do the same as triple, which is kill the thing or right. kill the player. It's the difference between between Crater Hoof and Overwhelming Stampede, right. where it's like d dead versus double dead. They're the same. <laughs> uh, there's Gratuitous Violence, which is two red, red, red uh, for basically the enchantment that does a doubling again. Mm -hmm. uh, that card is $3. Angress Marauders was $1.80. Solfim, the new Dominus in red, says if a source you control would deal non-combat damage to an opponent or permanent uh, in opponent controls, it deals double that damage to that player or permanent mm -hmm. instead. And if you're really into tripling, <laughs> you can do Jessica's Thrice, Thrice Reborn will triple the damage your commander does. If you're like, if you're like, I gotta triple it. Right, but I want triple. I yeah. don't want double. Yeah, Je Jessica will help your commander out and that's only $4.50. Yeah, I've played with fire emancipation quite a bit mm -hmm. um and i've found it to be pretty awkward in that it is similar to doubling season as far as it is going to be six mana you're going to play it and often you will not be able to take advantage of the triple mm -hmm. part of it until your next turn you're right. you're like okay and then next turn i'm going to cast whatever uh comet storm or some yeah. sort of earthquake or something like that Solfim actually in a lot of ways was better because it only affects your opponent's stuff when it takes the damage and mm -hmm. fire emancipation can get awkward with hitting yourself. So if you're going to heartless hit a Tsugu or something like that. Yep. So there's a lot of reasons why fire emancipation is awkward. Even, you know, it once you get it out, just figuring out how to sequence it and whatnot. Like you said, you really need a way that like I have an attack. I'm playing this and attacking in. Right. I have a tap ability. I'm playing this and I'm tapping that ability and I'm getting the triple right now. And that's it's harder to set up than you think is all I'm saying. <laughs> I, <laughs> I still have it in that. a couple decks, but I often... It's am, sweet. I often do not play it in the game. Yeah. Uh, the next one... The next one, the price is purely attached to availability. Uh, it's Imperial Seal and it's $90. Uh, Imperial Seal is a tutor. It's a one... A single black mana for a sorcery that says search your library for a card, then shuffle and put that card on top. You lose two life. So it's basically Vampiric Tutor with um, it's sorcery. It's a sorcery speed. Yeah. And Vampiric Tutor is extraordinarily powerful, but also Vampiric Tutor is $40. Yeah. So um, just strictly better Vampiric Tutor. Yes. And more than half the price. So already you shouldn't buy Imperial Seal if you don't have a Vampiric Tutor. Like, yeah. yeah, right? This this was, was the thing when they reprinted Imperial Seal. It's like when it was $700 or whatever it was, everybody knew that it was like, I'm not going to buy that. But right. then when they reprinted it, I was so worried about Commander players running out. Yeah, because the card's bad. You're still not playing Imperial it. Imperial Seals. And it's Imperial Seal, I would say, is like the fourth or fifth best tutor in commander it's definitely behind demonic tutor yeah, definitely. it's definitely de behind, de behind vampiric tutor yeah. i would say it's but be it's behind grim tutor which is three mana but puts it into your hand it's right there i think yeah it's, yeah i mean like putting it on top of your deck and then passing the turn <laughs> you need a way to draw it yeah. like immediately which means that you already need another thing on board for it to be good like it imperial seal sees play in cd cdh where they want every single tutor in the colors yeah, you really have to ask yourself if you're even considering Imperial Seal for $90. It's like, mm. why do you want to tutor so badly? You have a combo or something right. in that deck. And then even then, if that is the case, you've got what I really like is uh, as an alternative is Scheming Symmetry. Yeah. Which is one black, you tutor, and another player tutors. Does the same thing as Imperial Seal, but it will, in the situation where you're going to combo off, do the exact same thing, right? Yeah. It's functionally the same as Imperial Seal if you're ready to go right now. And it's only $7.50. And the thing is, if you are looking for the best in slot number three tutor, because you already have the other two and you're mm -hmm. trying to combo, then you're going to be using it to end the game in that way. Right. Then now it's is kind of the fourth slot down then because I'd put it behind Scheming Symmetry because of price. Right. Yeah. It's like Wishclaw Talisman puts it to hand for three mana. So it's hard to, like, if Grim Tutor's in the list, then Wishclaw Talisman's also on the list. Yep, yep. Diabolic Intent is, is a tutor, but you have to sacrifice that a creature. Sure. That's a little harder And that goes to hand. Yeah. It's a little harder. But it's, like, the, you know, these cards are $9. Wishclaw Talisman is $3.50. You do not need to spend $90 
Like $90 doesn't mean the Imperial Seal is good. $90 means they haven't printed a lot of Imperial Seals. <laughs> yeah, and I would also say that in general, you know, if it's not a CDH deck, and most of the cards we're talking about, not most, but a few, like Fierce Guardianship, mm-hmm. have to be reevaluated if you're playing CDH of because, course. you know, in that format, like the one percentage does matter a little bit more. Right. You know, but in general, if you're playing more casual commander, you're newer to it, another tutor is not what you want in your deck, right? Yeah. In general, that's not how people are playing the game. You're not trying, you know, to have your entire deck revolve around getting a specific card or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, if that is what your deck wants to do, then, you know, having another way to do that might be worth it to you. But your deck probably already costs thousands of dollars if you're right. to the point you're where you're spending 90 on the... Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. But if... if yeah. In any other deck, the ninety dollars is just egregious. Yeah, I and I I was thinking about this, and I was like, okay, if you're really worried about tutor density, clearly you're looking for something specific, and there are other ways to find that that you don't have to spend ninety dollars. Yeah, and they're not as mana efficient, but they put the card in your hand, and this is the transmute cards. There's a tra- there's black transmute cards at two mana, at three mana, at four mana, and at five mana, and they all have abilities that say one black black, discard this card, look for something with the same mana value as this card. So if you have, like, I'm going to find my combo piece, and you know your combo piece is a three drop, you can go find it with a transmute card, and these cards are pennies on the dollar. Transmute is kind of critically underrated and oh has God. always meant, yes. yeah, because these are tutor cards. Yeah. Yeah. And if like, if you have a tutor for a reason, even if your combo is the dumbest combo ever and you're like, I just need to be able to find it, like these will go find it. And you usually in your deck have like Necropotence or something you right. know that's like, okay, if I already have that combo piece in hand or mm-hmm. that really important piece, I have two or three other cards that are just good in all situations that right. this will then go get instead. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about is like, if you have all these tutors and you're like, I really, I just really want to find the right cards. It's possible that you're just as you're you would be just as served by a big draw spell, especially in black, than you would be searching for one card and giving it to you in a second. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so anything that draws you a number of cards yeah. could get you both your combo pieces or, right. you know, just get you a lot of good stuff where instead of one good thing, yeah. Right. I really like this. Uh, you've got Greed, Painful Truths, which is a little a bit of an underrated card, I think. So uh, Siphon Mind, which makes your opponent's discard, then you draw... I really like Stinging Study. I've been playing this mm-hmm. a lot it's recently. Really it's like four and a black for an instant, and the instant is really prime here. You draw X cards and you lose X life, or X is the mana value of a commander you own on the battlefield or in the command zone. So as long as you know that your commander's mana value is four or more, mm-hmm. Stinging Study is amazing. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, if you draw I, at least four off of it, and you know this when you build the deck, because yeah. you know what your commander is, yeah. and the commander doesn't have to be cast. It's not like Fierce Guardianship either. Yeah. It's, there are ways in black to put a ton of cards into your hand. And it like, I, I think people, especially casual players with tutors, will think of them as like, oh, like, I'll go find the card I need in this situation. Yeah. Um, uh, Imperial Seal is very bad for those situations because it doesn't give doesn't you a, put it, it your doesn't hands, put it in your hands. Sorcery speed, yeah. So a big draw spell can be as toolboxy and can serve your deck as well as like a mediocre tutor, especially one that's ninety dollars. Black also does have uh, tutors that don't go to your hand, so something like Entomb. So yeah. also depending on your deck and what it's doing, an Entomb could be a cheaper version of an Imperial Seal. So it, in certain decks, Imperial Seal. Like, even farther down on the list because right. if you're like, no, I'm cool. I want it to, I actually want stuff in the graveyard or ever buried alive or whatever. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we have a number of cards left to go on our list. Uh, stay tuned to make sure that you are not buying a card that you could replace easier and save you some dollars. Uh, but first we're going to go to a mid rural ads. Ugh, so many sites, so many resumes. Hiring is a nightmare. Hmm. How does Elishnorn find such loyal workers? I mechanize their flesh and bind them to my will. Oh. No, I don't think I could do that. Then use Indeed, you sniveling fool. With Indeed, all will be in one place. It's the perfect platform to attract, interview, and hire new employees in a flash. Thanks to powerful tools like Instant Match, which gives you a short list of qualified candidates the moment you sponsor a post. Oh, my favorite, screenings and assessments. Oh yeah, with assessments I can add over 100 different skill tests to my job post. Then I'll know everyone I'm looking at is actually qualified. Now I can skip the boring stuff in the interview and focus on what matters. Like achieving perfection? Oh, Elish Norton, you complete me. That is the plan. Wait, what? 
Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash command zone to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash command zone. Again, Indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Hi-ho, human friends. We're the seven dwarves. I'm talky. This is worky, jumpy, greedy, shouty, smiley. And Ted. What up? Hi ho! We're here to talk to you about Raycons. It's the time of year to make big changes, which can be just as hard as mining through rock and stone. But take it from us, even small things can add up to a big impact in life or on the battlefield. You can start by shaking up your routine with Raycon wireless earbuds. I use mine when I mine. They're water and sweat resistant, and the big tunes have really helped me keep my energy going. Eight hours of playtime make them perfect for getting through a long day counting my rubies. It's premium audio and half the price of other brands, so you'll want to buy a pair. And a spare. And one for me. I'll take a pair. I got mine in sleek frost white. Or should I say snow white? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dwarf humor. Ready to buy something small with a big impact? Go to buyraycon.com slash command today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash command to score 15% off. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Hey, Rachel, Foundry Inspector. It's a good ramp card, right? Sure. It's cost reduction, so the more spells you cast, the more mana you save. Well, Honey does basically that, but for money. I like money. Tell me more. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for coupons and promo codes so you don't have to. All you do is install Honey and shop online like you normally do. Then when you get to checkout, just click apply coupons and Honey will automatically find any working promos you can apply. And it doesn't just work on desktops, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. No matter what you're buying, dog toys, desk lamps, monitors, video games, Honey can help you find deals on just about anything. So it's just strictly better than shopping normally? Yeah, last week I was looking for a new Bluetooth speaker and honey found me a $35 cashback deal. Huh, that's just enough to buy you a Ristic study. <laughs> I'm way ahead of you. Josh, you have a problem. Yes, I do. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash command zone. That's joinhoney.com slash command zone. All right, we're back. We are talking about the commander staples that are not worth the price we're about halfway through here Mm -hmm. the next one it's a it's a good card but uh i run it less and less these days for sure yeah it's it's a white card so we're not picking on green still and it's a 38 dollar card it is land tax for a single white this is an enchantment that says at the beginning of your upkeep if an opponent controls more lands than you you may search your library for up to three basic land cards reveal them put them into your hand and then shuffle your library so um, the first thing you put here is the thing we always say when we talk about land tax, which is land tax is not a ramp spell. A ramp spell is something that gets you more mana available to you than you would have if you just made one land drop for a turn. Mm-hmm. Land tax doesn't put lands into play. It puts them into your hand. So land tax is a card draw spell. It's a card advantage spell. Yeah. It gives you more cards in your hand. Now, those cards just happen to be lands, which does guarantee you will hit your land drops, but it does not give you uh, access to more mana than you would otherwise have. And I think land tax really became a staple when white really, really struggled with card advantage. Yeah. Where it's like white had didn't have any card draw and land tax was card draw. It gave you the lands. It gave you the velocity that you needed to make sure you were keeping up with your opponents. And now that Wizards has printed more and more and more draw for white, something like land tax becomes a lot less valuable. Yeah, because I'd rather just draw cards that have the chance of being spells. Yeah. You know, if, if, if land tax is great if I don't have that option. Mm-hmm. But when I do, I, I'm like, well, would you rather draw three cards, but you know their lands, or two cards, but they could be spells? But they could be spells? I mean, usually two cards, but they would be spells. I agree. These lands gum up your hand, and yeah. you're like... You end up discarding, discarding a, a lot of them. them, yeah, which can be good, um, yeah. depending on what else is going on. It's deck thinning. Yep. <laughs> um, which we know just statistically doesn't matter much. But yeah, yeah, you've got 100 cards. It's... A lot of thinning needs to happen there. Yeah. Um, but they've given White a lot of great tools for card draw. And one of my favorites lately has been Rumor Gatherer. Mm. Is one white white with a card with alliance. It says, whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. If this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn, draw a card instead. 
So if you can play two creatures, you're going to draw. And the scry mm-hmm. is actually worth some percentage of a card, right? Right. Because you can say, oh, I don't need lands. I'm putting that one on the bottom. Right. Yeah. So it, and in, in white, you, it's very easy for you to get tokens on the board. It's very easy to, for you to do tokens at instant speed. And you can keep triggering this thing over and over and over again. This the card is insane in my Hazis on deck because it makes two tokens at the same time. So you scry draw. Nice. Uh, every time. It's yeah. really cool. <laughs> Uh, you've also got Takasha's Welcome on here, which is two and a white for an enchantment. Whenever one or more creatures with mana value three or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. Uh, this ability triggers only once each turn. Mm-hmm. So this is just another sort of card draw spell for white because you tend to have small creatures. Great thing, too, if you have creatures with flash or can create tokens on other players' turns, then you could draw on more than more one. More and yeah. more. And, yeah. This is just a card that, you know, Welcome to Vampire is very similar. Yeah. These cards didn't exist. Yeah. And land tax looks a lot better when those cards don't exist. But now you're like, eh, I'm, I'd am i rather have a card that can be yeah. a spell. Yeah. I'm drawing plenty of cards. And I know you look at those and you're like, those require me to be doing something. I was like, I, 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 sure. But, but those are things that white decks that generally white want just, to do. The white yeah. decks do. Yeah. If you want something a little bit more passive, I really liked Master of Ceremonies. It's not exactly a card draw spell, but it says at the beginning of your upkeep, each opponent chooses money, friends, or secrets. For each player who chose money, you and that player each create a treasure token. For each player who chose friends, you and that player each make a citizen token. And for each player who chose secrets, you and that player each draw a card. Wow. It's a ton of value. It triggers on your upkeep, and people are always greedy. <laughs> always. One person will give you the card every time. It's usually one responsible player that gives you a token, one who's like, yeah, but I could cast this spell if I wanted to, and they get a treasure token. And then and Jimmy. Then, and then Jimmy's like, a card, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, Jimmy, no, no, no. Oh. <laughs> and then you have, uh, you, the, this four mana elef- or rhino has just given you a ton. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, also... Other ways to replace the land search, if that is the reason that you wanted land tax in your deck, that are much more cost effective as far as dollars. Mm -hmm. So Weathered Wayfarer is one white for a 1-1, and you can pay a white and tap it to search your library for a land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. You can only activate, though, if if you have an opponent that controls more lands than you do, which is a common sort of writer clause in a lot of white. Yeah, it's the same stick as land land tax. Yeah, Archaeal Ministers map has similar wording. Right. Uh, um, Gift of Estates will put lands into your hand. Oresco's Explorer will put lands into your hand. These cards are extremely inexpensive. They're yeah. like $1.30 and $0.35, respectively. Weathered Way- Wafer just got a reprint, and it's only $3 now. Um, and that one will let you search for any land. Yeah. So if you've got specific utility lands, you oh, can go get point. them. And then if you want to upgrade the actual... Two- you know, make this card into ramp, right? Yeah. Take out your land tax and put in a card that's going to ramp you, give you access to more mana. Then cards that are still cheaper, but not quite as cheap as the other cards we've been talking about mm-hmm. uh, to fill that slot. Something like our Kaomancer's map is $12. It's two and a white for an artifact. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you search for two lands, sorry, basic planes, mm-hmm. and you put them into your hand. But then whenever a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, if that player controls more lands than you, you can put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. So you do get to ramp. And this continues to work regardless of what lands, whether you've yeah. used those two lands that you drew, right? Mm-hmm. You're still going to draw other lands in the course of the game. So this allows you to keep up with the player with the most lands. Yeah. Keeper of the Accord does a similar thing, except for it searches and puts it onto the battlefield if you have less lands than each, each player. So they have given white ways to draw cards. They have given white ways to, to ramp, especially a land ramp. You don't have to pay $38 for this effect anymore. Yeah. Again, this is a very good card still in some mm-hmm. decks. I, I say it's, it's very it's, efficient, especially when you're pairing it with red and you've got things like Faithless Looting and Thrill of Possibility yeah. and Cathartic Reunion and you're rummaging and things like this because then you can turn those lands you got into actual cards. Mm-hmm. But again, that's narrow, kind of similar to that original thing I said about Avacyn where it's like any deck you build will not necessarily want a land tax. So if you're going to spend $38 on something for your collection, but it's really going to be narrow in the number of decks it can go in, unless you already have a big collection it's not efficient to buy a card like this. You're way better off spending your money on something like a sort of feast and famine that you can just go in any deck. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Moving next on. Up, yep. I can't believe this next card is $28. Yeah. It's a planeswalker. It's Liliana, Dread Horde General. Four black black for a six loyalty planeswalker. Whenever a creature you control dies, draw a card. Plus one, create a two, two zombie. Negative four, each player sacrifices two creatures. Negative nine, the ultimate. Each opponent chooses a permanent they control of each permanent type and sacrifices the rest. This is a very powerful card. 
I and I think it, most of the time when it winds up in a deck, it's there for that static ability. Yeah, that first class. Yeah, that the whenever a creature you control dies, draw a card. Yep. Um, and the rest is sort of gravy on it. The thing about that is there are many cards with this effect uh, that cost significantly less. Like Dark Prophecy has almost exactly that wording. Whenever a creature you control dies, you draw a card and lose one life. And it's on a three mana. It's a black, black, black enchantment. Mm hmm. So, and that, yeah, that card's $3, uh, $3 and 60 cents for a dark prophecy. So you can get this kind of effect cheaper. So it's, you know, obviously you want redundancy and, and that in decks that want to draw cards when you sack stuff, but you can get like Erebos bleed card. It does basically the same thing. Yep. It's, I mean, I think there is some synergy here that the other, well, Erebos does allow you to sacrifice creatures on it. Because mm-hmm. um, playing Liliana and then negative fouring is like some a thing you see a lot. Yeah. Which is like every sack two creatures, but when I do it, I draw two cards. Right. And it gets, you know, cleans soft up a lot board of wife yeah. kind of and still has a thing left over people have to deal mm-hmm. with. You know, that is powerful. Uh, so it's the combination adding together right. that really uh, I think is sort of putting it ahead of dark prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. But Erebos bleak hearted is a really good one because again, it does have pay one and black sack another uh, creature target creature gets negative two, negative one until end of turn. So it has the ability to do, you know, two of the steps. Right. Sort of on it to sack a creature and then yep. you can pay two life and draw a card and it's $2 for... and 80 cents. Yeah. Yeah. And that's this kind of thing we've, we've printed a lot of, and it's like, I, I really like this card. It's body count. Mm. Uh, it is an instant with spectacle for black. So if you can cast it for a spectacle cost, uh, if an opponent has lost life this turn, but it's an instant, so could happen whenever it says draw a card for each creature that died under your control this turn. And that's this card. I think it's like $2. Um, and it has, it has that same thing where I'm turning bodies into creatures and it happens at instant speed. So you can do it in response for, to a board wipe or, uh, yeah, if you've done some sort sack of outlet. sacking yeah. aristocrats thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen it used in that way where they go through some rigmarole and it's not infinite, but they manage to sack the same creature or a sequence of creatures like a few times in a row. And they're yeah. like, so I've sacked uh, 12 or 12 of my creatures have died this turn. Yeah. And then they're like, One I'll draw 12. <laughs> draw 12. <laughs> You're like, oh my yeah. Lord, come <laughs> on. And usually there's like a blood artist or something out there and doing that. Right. And that's so they've lost the life. damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, a pretty cool card. I like it a lot. Plum the Forbidden is also an underplayed one, I think. Uh, this this one has snuck up a little bit, so maybe it's not as underplayed as I think, but I, it's like $2.60, I think. For one and a black, it's an instant. It says, as an additional cost to cast this spell, you may sacrifice one or more other creatures. When you do, copy the spell for each creature, sacrifice this way, and the spell itself says you draw a card and you lose a life. So you can sack six creatures and draw six cards for two mana. Right, you draw seven, right? Seven. Yeah, you copy it that many times. Oh, my God. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. Grim Horror Specs, uh, Midnight Reaper, they both have that static. When another non-token creature you control dies, draw a card. Yeah. Yeah. So one's another and one's not another, but you get it. The main difference with Grim Horror Specs and Midnight Reaper is the non-token clause. Yeah. I think you can assemble what Liliana is doing with a couple of cards, and often those cards are cheaper CMC. Six mana is a lot. I think Liliana is still good. It is, yeah. But you can... Your deck can be, you know, 99.9% as effective with one of these other cards as long as you have enough other sack outlets and stuff in there. Right. Um, yeah. I, and I think that's worth, something that you said is, is something that is worth saying is Liliana. If you're casting Liliana, you should be minusing Liliana. Yeah. Um, because I've played against it a lot of times where they'll slam it and I'm like, I'm going to lose two of my creatures and then they'll make a zombie and you're like, I have a chance. (laughs) (laughs) And it's because they want to protect their planeswalker, but just get that value out of it. It's so powerful. You draw two cards to replace the creatures you sacrifice and everybody else sacks two creatures. So you just got a, what, eight for one. Yeah, it's, it's and you it's, still have the the. It's extremely powerful. You still have the planeswalker, so, so it's really like a nine for one. If even if they just swing in, like it's nuts. If you spent the twenty eight dollars on yeah. Liliana, play it right. Use the minus. Then play it right. Use yeah. the minus. <laughs> All right, this next one is the most contentious for sure. It is one of the most powerful cards in the format. Some yeah. people could even say claim that it was the most powerful, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it would at least be in the conversation. Yeah. And it is also $200. It is Mana Crypt. It's all the way back up to $200. It feels like... When did they last reprint it? Uh, What is that symbol? It was a Double Masters. Double... Is this Double Masters 2022? 
Whatever it was. Oh it no, was, it's double masters because to, the no, mana vault right. was in was in yeah. d- the second one. It's zero mana for an artifact. You can tap it for colorless, colorless. So it's a soul ring for zero mana. But it says at the beginning of your upkeep, flip a coin. If you lose the flip, mana crypt deals three damage to you. A negligible amount in our format where mm. we start with double life anyway. And I I think this conversation that we that we will have applies to a lot of very expensive fast mana where it's it's mana vault is forty three dollars mox opal is eighty five jeweled lotus is one hundred and twenty dollars oh, right. yep. um I've even played against mox diamonds that are like seven hundred and thirty dollars yeah like not, mox diamond is like not seven hundred dollars with magic card yeah not worth it um it's these are good cards and there's nothing that we can say that makes them worse cards there doesn't even have the claw the the thing i've been saying which is like it only goes in certain decks no, no. It, it would go in all any deck you want the the thing is like i don't i don't think any magic card in commander in casual commander is worth two hundred dollars yeah and i think like e- if mana crypt isn't worth two hundred dollars then no magic cards are worth two hundred dollars right like if, if just bang for your buck yeah, yeah yeah that's what i that's what i mean because you're replacing one card it's not like you're getting four mana crypts and your deck is that much better you're you're getting one mana crypt and you will see it one percent of the time right. <laughs> no, that's not the correct that's not the correct way you'll see it like 10 percent of the time or something yeah. like that but it just it, it i don't think it changes your deck 200 dollars <laughs> it doesn't change your deck $200. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this part is where we get into the realm where it right. is a little more difficult to talk about because what $200 is worth to an individual person is different. Is different, of course. It's different based on what your socioeconomic status is, what other priorities you have in your life, you know, what part of, of the world you live in, all kinds of factors. Yeah, right? what kind of magic you like playing. Yeah. But... I do agree. And I have a lot of decks that don't have mana crypt in them, obviously, because A, I don't own unlimited mana crypts, but also I have mana crypts that aren't in decks because mana crypt does make your deck more powerful, but mm-hmm. it is it is one of those things where like it doesn't feel right to be playing it in certain certain pods, right? Right. It doesn't feel right to have a deck that has a mana crypt in it against people that have you know, pre-con level stuff or, or even in the six, you know, low seven ranges of power levels, that doesn't feel like a place where it's warranted that I have a mana crypt in my deck. So I just wouldn't play that deck in those pods. So now all of a sudden I'm like, well, I need decks to play in those pods. So those decks don't want mana crypt. And now all of a sudden mana crypt is less useful to me because it can't go in all my decks. Right. It's, Mana Crypt is interesting because you're like, it does make your deck better. So I, I was like, okay, your odds of draw, drawing a Soul Ring on turn one is about 8%. Right. And that's, we know the power of of having a Soul Ring on turn one. Right. Yeah, you have about a 5% better chance to lose the game. It's just, yeah, you'll get murdered uh, because <laughs> you've been, you're so much more <laughs> <Yeah>. ahead. <laughs> Three people decide that you have to die. Uh, and you have a 10% chance of drawing it by turn three, where it's still like an extremely impactful card for you yep. to draw. If you add a mana crypt or a second piece of fast mana, uh, so if you add a, a vault a vault or something like that, your odds of drawing fast mana on turn one jumps up to 15.6%. And by turn three, it's almost 20%. So one in five games. Well, yeah, you'll have fast mana inside of the first few turns. Yeah. So that, it speeds your deck up. Like it definitely does. It's inarguable, yeah. yeah like there's just, it's it's like a, it's a full 10% chance difference right that that you're going to be faster but the thing is like how much do you value your deck going faster because like are you trying to keep up with your friend who plays four pieces of fast mana then then maybe buying a mana crypt is worth it to you but if you're in a play group where like most of your friends don't have mana crypts then I I don't think it's worth the money. I think your friends will be frustrated. <laughs> well, and the thing you got to compare this to is not just what this card does, but what two hundred dollars could do for you in a- other areas yeah. of your deck, right? So you could buy two doubling seasons. <laughs> <laughs> Bada bing! How could you lose? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, you split that up, and I I believe most. You know, if you were to buy ten twenty dollar cards, yeah. those cards you're going to draw multiples of them in every right. single game are more likely to uh, increase the power level of your deck. But it does really depend where your deck sits. If you're yeah. looking and you're like, "Well, I don't have ten cards I could add to this mm-hmm. deck," then that's when Mana Crypt starts to maybe become a consideration as far as worth right. it for the dollar amount. But 
you know, if you're a newer player or you've got a lot of decks in your collection spread out again, and you have a lot of, you know, slots in each deck that could be upgraded. Now, all of a sudden, yeah. upgrading multiple slots will often do more for you than upgrading this one slot. And also, like, it, it is just a little bit more fun to have a card that does something be the cool cards in your deck. Yeah, in general. Yeah, I, I get it, though. This card is powerful, and I think this is the one that people will argue with the most, and yeah. they're not wrong. No, I agree. Yeah. I it I think this has the biggest question mark over it. It has to be: Is it worth this much money to you? Yeah. Because like, what are what are your priorities when you're building your deck? What are you trying to get out of out of this upgrade? Are you trying to move faster? Are you trying to make it more synergistic? Are you trying to make it more fun for you to play? Uh, are you trying to keep up with your play group? Um, all of those are questions that you need to ask yourself before you buy a mana crypt. But the thing is, yeah, it is colorless. If you buy a mana crypt, you have it can go in any deck. If you take it apart, it can go in another deck. And will, that's it'll be good in all of them too. It will. Yeah, it it goes in all of the decks. If will, any card is worth two hundred dollars, this is the one. It's mana crypt. I will say we don't allow it on game nights anymore. So if you're yeah. playing a game nights deck, we've sort of uh, you know I don't know if we've ever said this, but we mm-hmm. we house banned it, I guess, or shadow banned it, or whatever you want to say, only because we don't believe it generally makes for good on-camera games because it it creates a situation where like, well, if you just happen to draw it, like there's nothing yeah. about it. Did you draw it? Did you not? And of course, every Game Nights deck would have that card in the deck if they could because, right. you know, we just allow you to use whatever cards that exist. Like we're not, Game Nights is not about, um, you know, anything except for like, we've got a commander, build the coolest version of the commander mm-hmm. that you would want to build, right? Just right. use all the cards that exist. We're going to track down the cards for you or whatever. But we found that like, what tends to happen is like, well, at least one person in the pot, if they all have mana crypt in their deck, will draw it somewhat early. Right. And that creates a, a thing where they're ahead and everybody else has to gang up on them. And then all the games feel kind of samey. Right. One player comes out to an early lead, gets either crushed by the other players or is or able to... Wins. Yeah. Or is able to turn that into victory very quickly. And neither of those scenarios end up being very fun to watch all the time. So when we found that the games got a lot better once we started saying like, no more mana crypts uh, in anybody's deck. And... Everyone's equal because nobody can have it. Yeah. So nobody can really complain except for Post Malone who complained about it a lot. But then, <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing we said that I should say to sort of even this out and just finish the conversation is we also said if you mulligan at least once, you're not allowed to have Soul Ring in your opening hand. Mm, yeah. Because we found if we allow you to mulligan a bunch, you're just always going to find a Soul Ring hand. You're going to find a Soul Ring. it creates the exact same scenario. Right. It's fast mana changes the game and it really can swing. Like it, it can be a coin flip where if you get it, that's it. You can, nobody's catching up at all. Yeah. So I, yeah, Mana Crypt at your own, at your own, uh, at your own risk. Risk yeah. for sure. <laughs> all right. Uh, the next one's interesting. We've been saying this for years. Yeah. I love this. So the next cards that are not worth the price are original dual lands. They're not worth it. Yeah. So here's the list. This is nuts. Yeah. Taiga is $378. Tundra, $550. I'm assuming these are all revised. Uh, yes. Scrubland, $315. Badlands, $432. Plateau, traditionally the cheapest, $390. Let's go to the blue ones. <laughs> Volcanic Island, $950. Tropical Island, $700. Underground Sea, $810. Savannah, $360. And Bayou, $530. These are outrageous prices. And yes, the lands are good. They're good. They're, yeah, of course. But th- th- I these are this is where we were talking about earlier, where like the next best land, the closest to this, yeah, is a percentage point worse. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, very, very. Like, yes, it's worse. Like how much? How much worse? Worse is like a steam vents than a volcanic island. Like the two life is is what is two out of forty? It's something, but it's, it's little. Not, it's not very much. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the grand scheme of things, it just doesn't really make a difference. I mean, a little bit, you shouldn't shock yourself a lot, but like even just let's talk about a basic. Yeah. So you've got like Taiga taps for red and green. It comes in untapped. It's fetchable. It is arguably 100% better than a basic because it just has another, because it just has another color. Yeah. It's like two basics stapled together. It's close to strictly better. Even that, even just swapping a forest for a Taiga that makes your deck 1% better. <laughs> maybe. Like, maybe? Maybe a percent. Like, it really depends. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't think in general. Because 
you also have to factor in a whole bunch of things. Like, do you have rampant growth in your deck? Right. Do you have things that care about basic lands? There's a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get back to the triomes, the tri lands versus this. Yes, right. they come in tapped. They have to, but they yeah. tap for three. Yeah. So how much better is that than fetch lands? Fetch lands are way cheaper. It's still expensive, but yeah. way cheaper. And let me ask you a question. If you could choose between a volcanic island, you can only have one of these. Yeah. Either a volcanic island or a scalding tarn in your deck. Scalding tarn. Right? For sure. Yeah. So if you don't have all because, the fetch lands in your deck, you shouldn't even be thinking about. Because Volcanic Island isn't good without a Scalding Tarn. Like, it, the fetchability doesn't make it, like, if you if you don't have fetches, <laughs> then it's just a bond land. It's yeah. just the training center. Yeah. Yeah. Training center. It's yeah. just untapped. It's just an untapped blue and red source. Yeah. Which it's like as good as a check land if you don't have the fetches first. Yeah. So, and the fetches without the dual land still get basics. Still get basics, still get and shocks, still get cycling lands or what triumphs. What game are you in where you're like, if I don't have red and blue from this, yeah. I can't do anything. Yeah. One, you need one of those more than the other. Right. Yeah. And often <laughs> it doesn't matter either way. You've yeah. already got red and blue and you're just like, I just need something that taps for mana untapped. Yeah. And you can always get the the uh, basic land with the fetch land as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think dual lands, people look at them. And like I have a decent amount from my high school days when I mm -hmm. started playing. Yeah. And you'll play a tropical island, people, ooh, tropical island. And they think like, oh my God, that deck's a CEDH deck. <laughs> and you're like, this is my Tim deck, right? right. Like yeah. all I want to do is just cast my spells and play the cards that I love from when I was a kid. But Right. And you just have those. Yeah, but it, it doesn't make my deck more powerful than yours. Right. In fact, it's a Tim deck. It's not more powerful right. than yours. But because you played an expensive card. Right. Yeah. So this is like I understand why people buy buy dual lands because they're collectible and they're cool and they're old. Reserveless. So that's it's reserveless. A good buy, it's yeah. an investment. Mm -hmm. um, so there are reasons to buy dual lands. None of them are related to the power level of yeah, the or like or gameplay, unless you're playing legacy, um, which we're not. Uh, well, not, not in this podcast room. <laughs> um, yeah. If I was going to improve my Shockland mana base, I would immediately just buy all of the fetches and I, and that will improve your deck just as much as, as, yeah, it, way more than it buying any single one of these. A lot of people are like making doe eyes at dual lands and they don't have the fetches, they don't have the battle bond lands, they yeah. don't have the triumphs, and they don't have like the uh, the have lands, which are the lands that say, Do you have two basics? So mm -hmm. come in and play on uh, tap and, lands, have, yeah. and have uh, the basic land types. Yeah. Which are often just as good. You yeah. you you usually get to a point in a game where you've got at least two basics into play, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden things like Prairie Stream become just as good as a dual land. Yeah, and you can do that as early as turn three. So, yeah, it, yeah. I I I understand they're fancy. They're worth a lot of money, so they're definitely going to draw attention. But dual lands, you don't need them at all. In fact, yeah. Here's another thing on game nights. We just I just stopped. I we didn't shadow ban these. People are allowed to put them in their deck yeah. if they want to. But I just stopped using dual lands. I just did shocks and fetches, and it just doesn't change anything. My win percentage has not changed on game nights, yeah. and how my decks do have not changed. Right? Like nobody's noticed. I just stopped playing dual lands, and no difference was made by yeah. It. yeah. Just the price tag at the bottom of yeah. the deck list was the only change. Yeah, and I, I we haven't mentioned it, but I really like the slow lands that they printed in Crimson Vow and uh, mm. and Midnight Hunt. These are the ones that uh, if you control two or more other lands of any of any kind, they come and untapped so they're tapped in those first two turns which you know you can play tap land untapped land signet and then you're fine uh, but then they're untapped for the rest of the game and there's no stipulations to make i think they're great and they're all like yeah there's the two check and six lands dollars. like there's so if many you have lands a mountain, now yeah. they've got so many there's that so many you that you don't yeah you almost never play a game anymore where you really are worried about your mana base that much <laughs> like even five color decks are fine. oh yeah yeah you're 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 totally good all right, a couple more here to go. Yeah, this next one is colorless. And, you know, we'll probably get some flack for it, but it's Phyrexian Altar. This is a $30 magic card that is a three-mana artifact that says sacrifice creature, add one mana of any color. It's powerful. It's a it part is. of a lot of combos. It is. Um, this is my thing about Phyrexian Altar, is I feel like a lot of people just put it in their aristocrat decks and just use it as a free stack outlet, and then the mana just fizzles. <laughs> Floats onto the just, ether. Just floats into the into the night. And that's a, a way to use it, but that's not $30 worth of value. Like, right. if, if you're using Phyrexian Altar, I think you really need a way to take advantage of the colored mana. Because Ashnod's Altar is $7. And most of the time, better. And, and I it think, makes two colorless yeah, mana. Yeah, because yeah. it makes two colorless, yeah. yeah. And more mana is usually better than colored mana. Not always. Yeah. It's... I think you just have to be paying very careful attention for why do you have this in the in the deck and how do you take advantage of the mana and if you're getting $30 worth out of it. Because otherwise, 
You could just play a Viserys Seer, right? Yeah. That's like a, like Viserys Seer is an 80 cent card that says sacrifice a creature, scry one. You'll always have advantage out of the scry, the scry one. The creature-ness of it, it makes it good in black decks. And it's a free sack outlet that you paid less than a dollar for. Yeah, if what you need is a sack outlet, then Viserys here is what is is probably better. Yeah. I mean, in general, decks that want Viserys here want a lot of sack outlets. They just don't yeah. want to be caught without one. Right. Yeah. So I think that might be part of it. You've got Altar of Dimension here, which, right. will, yeah, that card is, again, often going to be just as good. Often you're probably milling yourself because mm-hmm. you want cards in your um, graveyard. Or if you're sacking a ton of stuff, you could, you know, deck your opponents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, never had that happen. Never heard of that. What are you talking about? The other one that I, I don't see play, that I, I haven't seen a ton of play uh, is Thermopod. Uh, this is a creature that says sacrifice a, sacrifice a creature, add red to your mana pool. So it has the same activated ability as Phyrexian Altar, but it's a single red. Of course, it's five mana and it's on a creature. Yeah. But like, if you're really after the colored mana sacrifice, there's other ways to do it. And that card is a dollar. Thermopod. So Thermopod. I think I've seen it in play one time ever. Yeah. Uh, Yaheni is another good one that a lot of people like. I love Yaheni. Three mana, two, two with haste. And it says, whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, put a one to counter on it. But also says, sack another creature. Yaheni gains indestructible until end of turn. An indestructible sack outlet. Yeah. It tends to get bigger over the course of the game. Like, Yaheni's often like swinging around for like 10 or 12 later in the game. You're like, geez, shouldn't let that stick around so long. And nobody removes it. (laughs) Yeah. And it provides the sack outlet part of it. Yeah. It's very strong. Yeah, I mean, this is the one on our list that I personally think I would push back on the most. Mm-hmm. $30 is not like an insane amount. If it was yeah. 50 or plus, I think I might be in more agreement. But yeah, we're right off. We're fresh off of a Phyrexian Altar reprint. So this is sort of as low the as this is going to get. And we know we it'll it. climb because it's been 75 plus in uh-huh. the past. It was almost 100 before the reprint. Yeah. Uh, and this is a card that is narrow. It doesn't go in every deck. You don't just put this in a deck. Um, right. You know, it's colorless, yes, but it's held back by the fact that you really need to be sacrificing creatures or want to sacrifice creatures to do it. But mm-hmm. that is an archetype that has a lot of support. And, yeah. you know, Golgari decks and Demir decks and Orzhov decks. All, there are all kinds, like, Aristocrats is just one of the most common yeah. uh, archetypes that exist. So you probably will find a home for it. Mm-hmm. And it it is very powerful. It allows you to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. Yeah. Like, you just have boards where you're like, well... You know, how many decks and how many situations have you been in where it's like, if I just had two more mana, I would win this turn. Well, right. Phyrexian Altar will, you know, often give you those two mana to mm-hmm. win that turn. Um, so I think it's closer. Yeah. Just give it just give it a firm look. Because, like, if you're playing Phyrexian Altar and it's just a sack outlet, there's $101 cards that are free sack outlets. And if you're playing Phyrexian Altar and you, you're you like, I want the mana and I want a lot of mana, and Ashnod's Altar is probably just better. Uh, but... Obviously, there are scenarios where Phyrexian Altar is worth every penny. It's just not every deck. Yep. All right. You put this one on here. I did. You snuck it in on me. I did. All right. The next card is Ristic Study. Ugh. $45. Mm-hmm. It's a little outrageous. Yep. Two and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may draw a card unless that, pay- that player pays one uh, generic mana. Do you pay the 45 <laughs> Do you pay the $45? Boy, oh boy. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And you're in blue. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to draw cards. And there's a lot of permanents that draw cards. I think I think the big thing about Rhystic Study that, that makes it so popular is that you don't have to do anything. You just pay three mana and and it it draws you cards. And there's lots of, like, Mr. Grimora is, often goes hand in hand, but Mr. Grimora is only a $7 card. It's insane that it's still only $7 after I know. all this time, yeah. It's crazy. I mean, it did just get reprinted in Dominaria Remastered, but... Oh, uh, okay. Well, that helps. Um, one I really like is Reality Chip. I run this in almost every blue deck now. Uh, this is a, a legendary artifact creature equipment jellyfish. <sighs> Uh, it says you may look at the top card of your library. As long as reality ship is a chat attached to a creature, you may play lands and cast spells from the top of your library, reconfigure two in a blue. So it's a two mana creature. And then if you pay two in a blue, it equips onto a creature and you yep. can start casting stuff off the top of your library. Yeah. I can't think of the name of that card right Future now. Sight. Future sight. Thank yeah. you. The big blue one. Yeah. Uh, that does the same thing. And but that I, costs five mana. This is an installment payment of five mana. Right. Right. The two thing, on layaway, then three. The thing that I like about reality ship is it's, it gives you value at two mana. Because you can look at the top card of your library, you know when to scry and when to draw, you know when to fetch and not to fetch. It's an 04, good against Craig. It's, a, it's an 0, yeah, it blocks all yeah. day. Uh, it's, it, you can reanimate it, you can like equip it, there's, and if there's a board wipe, 
and it's an equipment, it falls off and you keep it. So uh, there's a lot of positives to reality chip and it gives you a ton of card advantage and selection when it's only two mana. Yeah. So I, I like, obviously it doesn't replace Ristic study, but it is it can do a $3 good of it. Yeah. and does a very good impression. Yeah. Uh, you have ghostly pilfer on here, which I know is a pet card of yours. Yeah, it says whenever an opponent casts a spell from anywhere other than their hand, draw a card. So if your opponent has a reality chip, uh, you draw every time they cast off the top of their library. Every time they cast a commander, you draw. Uh-huh. If they cast from impulse draw, you draw. Yeah. If they it, cascade, you draw. Yeah. This actually happens more than you think it does. They flash back from the graveyard, you draw. Uh, and this is, you know, a two mana creature. And it doesn't matter if they pay one, pay the one, you get to draw. Uh, Midnight Clock, Verity Circle, also on your list here. Verity Circle, I've I've had a hit a hit and mess with. Yeah. It's whenever a creature or an opponent controls becomes tapped. If it isn't being declared as an attacker, you draw a card. Yeah, I tried it for a while. It's not, it doesn't actually end up playing that great. It does have an activated ability uh, for five mana to tap target mm-hmm. creature without flying. So you can sort of pay five to draw a card and tap something down. This is meta dependent. I think if you're in like a mana dork heavy meta, at like I've played in groups where everybody runs Lana War Elves and that kind of thing then you're re- like reliably triggering it. But it's something that you have to check in with your play group on. Certainly have played games where I play it and I'm like, you know, check back in three turns. I'm like, I drew one card off this mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Doesn't feel great. Yeah. If it didn't have the attacker clause, it would be quite a bit better. Oh yeah. It would be insane. Um, Insight is an interesting card you've got on here. It's two and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever one of your opponents plays a green spell, you draw a card. We love green and commander. Yeah. Like, most pods have have at least one green player. And if they're playing green, it's heavy green. Yeah. Green is the most popular color by quite a decent amount. And, yeah. yeah I mean, I've seen insights in play. I've played insights. They tend to draw you a lot of cards over mm-hmm. the course of the game. Because your opponent aren't just not going to cast their spells. Like, no, they have to. Yeah. They're like, well, what am I going to do? Not play? So, they just... They just give in they, you know yeah. they're gonna give you the cards yeah and it's 80 cents um and then of course there's lots of draw based permanence as long as it synergizes with Blue your deck. Is the card draw color you can just draw cards there's lots of ways to draw cards and i think it, it, there's a lot of cheap ways to draw cards you don't have to spend 45 dollars to do it yeah i do kind of agree that grizzly study is not worth 45 bucks because of the redundancy at that like effect and we always say you know we want you to have 10 card draw spells in your mm-hmm. deck if you've got if you're in the color blue Getting to 10 will be easy for you yeah. because there are so many ways to do it. And mm-hmm. so there's really not a good argument to spend $45 if you don't already have the Ristic study. Yeah. Um, but if you do have it, it's very good. It's very good. Put yeah. it in your deck. Which I happen to have a decent amount of them because it wasn't yeah. always $45. But yeah. yeah, it's hard to argue with the bang for the buck aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. It's just a, a very replaceable card, uh, as is this next one. Oh, uh, Post Malone's going to be so sad. I know. This is his game-winning card on uh, his first game nights. Yeah, but is it $21? How is it $21? I don't know. <laughs> it's Rise of the Dark Realms. <laughs> it's uh, seven black black, so nine mana for a sorcery. Put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control. Give me everything. All of them. So uh, something, uh, an important thing to mention about Rise of the Dark Realms is usually you put this in a deck that has a lot of creatures in your own graveyard because uh, you can't really rely on your opponents to have sweet graveyards. So usually your graveyard is the juiciest graveyard. Here. Yeah. Or you're milling everybody right. or doing a lot of board wipes. You right. know, you, you've got a plan here, hopefully, that's right. like... You know, my graveyard is going to be the best one, but I am also sort of working towards filling graveyards as I go along. Right. Um, so a good way to do this, that that you can steal your opponent's stuff from the graveyard, is Command the Dreadhorde, which is only 40 cents. Uh, it's choose any number of target creature and or planeswalker cards in graveyards. Command the Dr- Dr- Dreadhorde deals damage to you equal to the converted mana cost of those cards. Put them into the battlefield under your control. Command the Dreadhorde is ridiculous. It's an insane card. It also gets planeswalkers. It is an insane card. It's way better than Rise of the Dark Realms. And if they were the exact same price, I would still say play Command the Dreadhorde Six instead. mana versus nine is a big jump. Yeah, huge jump. And it's basically allowing you to substitute life for mana, which we know is broken every time they do it. See yeah. Bullis' Citadel, see Channel, see whatever you mm-hmm. want. Yeah, Command the Dreadheart is like really good. So just better than Rise of the Dark Realms in almost every way. For sure. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's not even an argument. Yeah, it's 40 cents. It's great. Uh, th- this one's kind of dumb, but it's fun. It's great betrayal. It's an enchantment. It says, whenever a creature you don't control dies, return it to the battlefield under your control with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it on the beginning of the next end step. That creature is a black zombie in addition to its colors and types. So if you're if you're relying on killing stuff and you're casting a lot of board wipes, that stuff will always come back under your control. And Grave Betrayal is a $3 card. That one's tougher, though, because it doesn't do anything. Yeah. The other ones do stuff. But Rise of the Dark Robles doesn't do anything if there's yeah, nothing in graveyards. Well, <laughs> yeah, but... Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think it's, Grave Betrayal is an analog. It's not very good. <laughs> yeah, it's just... But it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. There's a there's a lot a lot of ones that'll do it time dependent. Gotcha. So something like Thrilling Encore is put all uh put into the battlefield under your control. All creature cards in all graveyards that were put there from the battlefield this turn. It's an instant. It is this a card five is mana nuts. instant. Yeah. Yes. Jimmy's gotten me with this a few times. Yeah, he got I was in the in an episode where he cast it. It was crazy. Yeah. yeah. And this is a card that you just don't see coming. Not enough people play it. Mm-hmm. It's five mana rise of the dark realms, basically. It just yeah. feels like that. It's the crater hoof argument. Yeah. You don't need every Everything from all right. the graveyards. If you just get it, Command of the Dread Horde is the same thing. If you just get a, a lot, lot, you're yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you get five or six things, what else do you need? Right. Really, Encore is even better because you're doing it at an instant speed, which yeah. means it's about to be your turn probably. Right. And that means they basically have haste. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thrilling Encore is way better than Rise of the Dark Realms. Yeah. Rise I, of the Dark Realms, you do it and then you say go. You're and like, there's okay. three other players, and yeah. you think they're going to let you keep all that stuff? No, now you're in trouble, and yeah. you're going to have to block with some of those creatures. Uh, what I really like is Finale of Eternity. It's a sorcery with, that's black, black, and X. It says, destroy up to three target creatures with toughness X or less. If X is 10 or more, return all creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this one you can is a modal spell where so you can destroy some creatures early in the game, or if late game, you can reanimate your entire graveyard, and it's done. Obviously, you don't get your opponent's stuff as well, but that modality adds a lot, and that card is only $1.50. 12 mana is a lot, though. 12 mana is a lot. Okay. You can do some cool stuff. Are we talking about Living Death yet? Living Death, yeah. Because mm-hmm. that's the card I think of when people are like, Rise of the Dark Realms. I'm like, well, are you playing Living Death, though? Yeah, you play Living, Living Death. Yeah, it seems like a lot better. I mean, you have to do some sculpting. Yeah. Because they're going to get their stuff back, too. But like mm-hmm. you said, you know you have these cards in your deck. Right. And any deck that wants Rise of the Dark Realms would want Living Death even more because, mm-hmm. like, it's milling itself. It's sacrificing its creatures. Yeah. And it's going to play the game correctly to get it into the position where now I cast this and they lose everything and get almost nothing. And yeah. I lose almost nothing and get everything. Yeah. It's it, Living Death is just an insane card. It's only five do- five mana, and it's uh, well, yeah, five dollars. Uh, they've reprinted it a lot. It's extremely powerful. It's yeah. It's uh, often the card that I find myself like, oh god, I hope they don't have Living Death. And they always do. <laughs> I mean, there's just a lot of board states where you're like, if there's a Living Death, if we're there's dead. a Living Death, I'm screwed because I'm ahead right now, and yep. then they'll just it'll immediately flip, and then I'll I cannot win. Yeah. Yeah. Even like to the living death is so good that I like Twilight's call and Twilight's call is bad. <laughs> it's four black black for a sorcery. It says you may cast Twilight's call anytime you could cast an instant if you pay two more to cast it. So it's six mana sorcery, eight mana instant. Each player returns all creature cards from his or her graveyard to the battlefield. Yeah. So it's like before well, before you untap, I'm going to reanimate my whole graveyard. And now you've untapped and they have haste. Like that's so much more powerful than Rise of the Dark Realms. Way more powerful. And that's eight mana versus the nine. Yeah. Uh, the instant speed version. Obviously the six mana one is is fine. Um, with yeah. these cards, uh, sack outlets are very important. Yeah. Because, see, Twilight's called good with Phyrexian Arena. It is. Or Phyrexian Altar. Altar. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you're like, oh, cool. I want to get all the cards I have on the battlefield into the graveyard before I do this thing mm-hmm. because they're going to come back. Re- use all the ETBs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. And if you're very interested in stealing some stuff from your opponent's graveyard, you can do that as well. Like Ghoul's Night Out, I think, is an underplayed card. And a cool name. Yeah, it is. Three black black for a sorcery. It says, for each player, choose a creature card in that player's graveyard. Put those cards onto the battlefield under your control. They're black zombies in addition to their other colors, and they gain decayed. So they're not great attackers, but you're like, best creature from your graveyard, best from yours, best from yours, best from mine. Bam. That was five mana. five mana. It's ridiculous, yeah. (laughs) And that card's 40 cents. Sepulchral Primordial is another really good one with an ETB similar effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sepulchral often is like, play it, sack it, reanimate it, and you're like, oh, crap. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah. So 
Lots of effects. So you don't have to spend twenty dollars on this one. Rise is just bad. It's worse than Sepulchral. It's worse than Ghoul's Night Out. Even yeah, if they were worth the same amount of money, yeah. Living Death. It's worse than that. Like just cheaper is better in yeah. this case. Okay. All right. Uh, two more to go. Yeah. Uh, this one I bought when I was a new player, and I don't think it was a great investment for me at that time. Uh, I bought a strip mine for twenty dollars. It is currently fourteen. It's gone down. It's gone down. Apparently, more people uh, realize that it wasn't. I know. Did I, they reprint it? No, it, it's a, not really. Uh, it's also Wasteland. Wasteland's a twenty-five dollar card. Uh, I remember when Wasteland was a hundred. So yeah, Wasteland they have reprinted. Yeah. So, like, I bought Strip Mine because I was like, oh, it's a removal spell for lands. And it is. And it is. But I could have bought Ghost Quarter for 50 cents. Yeah. <laughs> and the Ghost Quarter does a similar thing, but instead of destroying any land, it hits a non-basic land and replaces it with a basic. Mm -hmm. So, it's a land removal spell that will, like, get rid of a target land and won't put your opponent behind. It does put you behind. So there is downside to Ghost Quarter. Yeah, the thing about Strip Mine is you're one for one with one opponent. Right. You're down to the other two, Yeah, but they don't get a land. So Ghost Quarter puts you down one and everybody else is the same. Yeah. Uh, Demolition Field is a newer one, yes. which does cost two mana to tap and mm -hmm. sacrifice, but you and the uh, person whose land you destroyed both find a land. So you're even on lands. Yeah. You've just spent three mana to remove the extra two the mana problem. does matter. The extra two mana does matter, uh, but it doesn't put you down a land, so it doesn't feel as bad to to pop it. Um, and, and generally, it, yeah. like you don't. Here's the thing: you don't generally want to pop your strip mine. Yeah, you because you're down the land. You mm -hmm. you what's what's the what's the inverse of ramp? What's the opposite you, of ramp? You pomard. <laughs> you did ramp it backwards. Yep. Okay. That's how I got there. The okay. old pmar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. So, and you generally don't want to do that. So mm -hmm. you don't end up doing it. People and, hesitate so yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. Listen, if you see a guy's cradle, like just do it. Just, just get do it rid now. Of do it right now. Mm. I, I got Nick those cabal coffers. Get rid of them. Yeah. If you have the answer. Use it. Ink moth nexus. I learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's what I like about demolition field mm. a lot is that you don't feel that same hesitancy because one, yes, it costs two mana, but once you do it, it didn't cost you any mm -hmm. board position. It's done. I have the same amount of mana I had before. Yeah. I just got rid of a problematic thing. Right. And it didn't even really cost me a card. It cost me some mana. Right. And that feels pretty good. So I actually think Demolition Field is a decent amount better than Strip Mine, mm -hmm. even though technically not because it costs the mana, but yeah. just from a mentality standpoint, you're way more likely to use it, which is usually the right play. Yeah. Yeah. So the, like Strip Mine is the, is the kind of card where it's like I bought a jackhammer to do a hammer's job, where like Strip Mine can be used as land destruction. You replay Strip Mine and to strip everybody's lands. But I was new to magic. I didn't know you could do that. Right. I, I'm not playing like, Crucible. I, with yeah, it. I'm not yeah. playing Crucible Strip Mine. I didn't, I didn't know that was a thing. Exploration Crucible like, Strip Mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew I had to be able to remove lands. So I bought a Strip Mine, which said remove land. <laughs> and it's a good card. Like it is. you're not, you're going to find a home for it. It is. It's going to play in a deck. It's going to do what you want it to do. I like to have one of these type of effects at at least in at least, all of yeah. my decks. I'd like a couple. Two but if I monocolor. Yeah, exactly. But Streamline doesn't have to be filling that spot because right. if you don't have Demolition Field in the deck, don't spend $14 on yeah. Streamline for sure. Yeah. I'd spend a dollar, get a Demolition Field. It will go, it'll go in a lot of decks. All right, right, what's the last one? One more. It's Wheel of Fortune. Come on down. That's a different one. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't say come on down. D yeah, you're already there. <laughs> <laughs> Does Wheel of Fortune have a catchphrase? <laughs> no, you're like, uh, spin that wheel. D wheel of yeah, Fortune. It's, its, own it's name. just a bunch it's of a people Pokemon. yelling it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> it says its own name. All right, it's two in a red for a sorcery. Everybody discard. Each player discards their hands and then draws seven cards. This is a three hundred and thirty dollar card. Um, and it's a reserve list card from yeah. Alpha. That's why. Yeah, and it's very powerful and it's very popular in Commander, um, and it's very replaceable. There's a ton of things that do exactly this. There's lots of things that that discard your hand and draw that many, but there's plenty that discard your hand and draw seven, which yeah. is usually why you would run a wheel. Uh, I'm a big fan of Wheel of Misfortune. It was one of my favorite cards that was printed, actually. You're a big fan of it? I actually like it, yeah. I mean, it's good. It's a mess. <laughs> That's the part I'm not a big fan of. It's easier to it's easier to explain than people give me credit for. It's like I don't we, know. we all pick a number. The highest takes a damage and wheels. The lowest doesn't wheel. What about the other two people? Everybody else wheels. Okay. Done. <laughs> That's it. Everybody understands. We played it once on game nights, and I think like, about never half again. the comments were that we played it wrong. Never we, we again. Definitely played it right. Yeah. Yeah. It's 
but it's a it's a replacement for Wheel of Fortune yeah. that they know that this that we needed and they couldn't do a direct reprint of Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, it is less good because you can choose basically not to wheel, mm-hmm. which is not always the option you want to give your opponent. Right. Although from experience, my opponents are very bad at knowing when they should not wheel, which is almost they should almost always wheel. You should almost always wheel. Yeah, but but usually one person will pick zero, and I'd say like. At least eighty percent of the time, they're wrong. They yeah. they've got four cards in hand, I, but I like my cards. But any seven cards in your deck are going to be better than the four you've got. You're just up three cards, so it actually ends up being better than Wheel of Fortune because my opponents will misplay. Will misplay it. Yeah. yeah. So that's an interesting thing. I also really like it in decks that care about damage because uh, some people who haven't played the card before will be like, like eight, and yeah. you're like, that's too high. For... <laughs> yeah. yeah. You never have to go over five, yeah. really. Five is is sort of high. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's Reforge the Soul, which is mm-hmm. the miracle version of Wheel of Fortune. That is a good card, but I found it to be not as good as Wheel of Misfortune because you five is really too much to be pay- paying. Yeah, with. I unless put you're Valica- miracling it. Yeah, I'd put Valakut Awakening on this list. That's a good one. Yeah, which is an MDFC, yeah. so it doesn't even take up a slot in your deck. It's uh, a little bit more expensive than I think some of these, but it's not three hundred thirty dollars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one I really like that I that you have a little bit of control over is imposing grandeur. It's each player may discard their hand and draw cards equal to the greatest mana value of commanders they own in the battlefield or in the command zone. Mm. So it's five mana, but if you have like like if I had run this in in Chiscoria, it's discard my hand, draw nine, and it's five mana to do that. But my gosh, that's a lot of cards. Yeah. So yeah, if you have the high the high mana commanders and you know your like opponents like to play at three or four, like this is just for you. Now you're not wheeling your opponents as much as you normally would be. So I think this card's a little underplayed. Five mana is a lot, but and there's a cool. ton that we're not even mentioning. There's, yeah, and there's ones that aren't even red. There's windfall and things in blue. Oh as yeah, well. they're in blue. There's tons. Yeah. So the wheel effect uh, is it's very good and very powerful, Mm -hmm. uh, but you can usually get it on other cards and it's nowhere close to this amount. And you can have full on wheel dedicated decks that do not have wheel of fortune Fortune. and are basically the same power levels as the ones that are, because it's that law of diminishing returns. If I have 10 things in my deck that Mm -hmm. wheel me, the difference between having an 11th or not is not very big. Right. Right. Because it's just what? Not 9% increase or whatever so yeah so it's not even you know it just doesn't increase the power of my deck that much for that redu- for that amount of redundancy if yeah. there were two and i any third that's the mana crypt situation right now yeah. it's a little bit different yeah now now the money starts to make a little bit more sense but 330 dollars is uh extreme and i think we're gonna see more wheel cards like this is a thing that they're I going to continue not. i we have I plenty they, they yeah. love printing them though I, like this I feel, is from val yeah i feel like they made a bunch of wheel decks and commanders like Braylon Shabraz and yeah. what was what's that is it one although I think it's technically Prismari that like when you discard a card draw a card Riel Riel yeah and and they made a ton of these Locust yeah. God and everything and I think yeah. they realized like oh crap there's too much of this now yeah. and we've made too many wheels and these the are one that makes snakes. too good and wheels are not great play experience for your opponents because imagine that game where on turn three you wheel and they just wheel into no lands or whatever and like that happens sometimes so yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't know that we'll can see be a, a bit ton more wheel stuff, but we're already at way more than critical mass. We're fine. We're fine. Yeah. We got plenty of wheel effects. You can spend a dollar or two dollars or five dollars on these and you'll be just fine. All right. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. By the way, we didn't put this on the uh, outline, yeah. so I'm putting her on the spot, but yeah. sometimes you come up with good ideas on the fly. I don't yeah. know if this is a good idea. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, of all the cards we mentioned on this episode, yeah. what do you think is the most egregious is the card that is the most like, hey, don't spend money on that. I mean, I it's hard to argue with doubling season, but ying, I don't know. No, no, no. Uh, mine's Imperial Seal. Mm. I think that card is bad. I don't think tutors make your deck more fun, <laughs> and it's almost a hundred dollars. Uh, and doubling season, at least if you buy a hundred dollars, if you get to have a doubling season, if that happens. You do have a ton of fun. Like, that is a big board. True, but I mean, it has to happen. You have to play it, then you have to do something afterwards. And a lot of times, 
you play it, you go, you cast the thing, and they go, cool. In response, I'll remove the doubling season. Yeah, you don't even like, get the double. No. And it's a hundred dollars for that card, and then it's a hundred dollars worth of sadness. Yeah, I'm it's one uh, of those two. I'm tempted to say original duels. Yeah. Because they're so expensive and yeah. add to the power level of your deck so little. And yeah. Like, I have noticed no difference, literally no difference over the last couple of years playing yeah. decks on game nights with no dual lands versus the first few years when we allowed dual lands in. Mm. My decks, ha- I never once think, well, boy, if I had dual lands in here, it'd, it'd it be, be so, much, so better. much better. It it makes no difference. I mean... <laughs> if somebody goes, turn one volcanic island, you're like, okay. It doesn't matter. I go yeah. turn one, you know, whatever shock land. A lot of times I put it into play tap because I have nothing to yeah, play. Yeah, Guildgate, and, same. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... I, I really think now yeah, there is the aspect where they are on the reserve list and mm-hmm. therefore, you know, they're an investment. Cause one thing about doubling season is if you spend a hundred dollars on it next year, they could reprint it. It'll be worth 50 for a minute, and, yeah. but it's going to go back up to a hundred. So. It always does. Yeah. But uh, okay. What do you think is the one on the other side of that? Yeah. The you closest. think is the closest to like, if I had to spend money on one of the cards that we talked about today, what would it be? Oh, <sighs> It feels like a boring answer, but I don't. Yeah, it's one of the colorless ones. It's Mana Crypt or Phyrexian Altar, probably. Because if if you like, like Mana Crypt just goes in a, in anything, and you're like, you'll, you'll find a spot for it in a higher power or something. You know, I, I like Phyrexian Altar. I think because if you need, if you want a Phyrexian Altar, you'll pay thirty bucks for it. Yeah. like for sure. And thirty is one of the lower end cards, right? Yeah. price on the whole list. Yeah, for sure. Okay, it was a trick question because the answer was Risk Study. All yeah. right, everybody. <laughs> to the listeners you got me <laughs> do you agree with our conclusions which commander staples do you think aren't worth the price tag or are there any that we talked about today that you're like no you guys are crazy you're wrong those are totally worth the price tag yeah, yeah. what other cards would you put in their place if that's the case yeah. Make sure, if you want to get yourself a Wheel of Fortune, a Mana Crypt, a Doubling Season, a Rhystic Study, a Land Tax, anything at all, cardkingdom.com slash command. That is the place to go to get your Magic product singles, anything at all. Your Magic players, you're going to buy Magic cards anyway. You may as well use our affiliate link when you do because you'll be simultaneously supporting the content you enjoy while getting the cards that, uh, you know, probably the replacement cards that mm-hmm. we talked about today are, are hopefully what you're going after. But again, like we always say, Card Kingdom is really, really great because they have a huge inventory. They're going to have all all the cards that you're looking for and they're going to package them all up into one tight little package and send that all at once to your residence, your place of business, whatever your mailing address is, cardkingdom.com slash command will get it there. Yeah, and once you have those cards in your hand, you're going to need to protect them. Go to ultrapro.com slash command to pick up the deck boxes and sleeves and binders and everything that you need that will keep your cards safe and pristine, especially if you invest in some of these more expensive cards. You really want to make sure you're investing in that protection as well. And Ultra Pro has some of the best quality pieces that you can pick up to protect or organize your collection. Make sure that your little cardboard squares... (laughs) are uh, maintaining some of the value that you've invested into them. They also have all of the official magic licensing. So if there's a piece of artwork that you really like or you really connect to, you can get it on a play mat. You can get it on a deck box or sleeves. Uh, Always keep an eye on their website because they've got a ton of cool art cycling through there, including secret layer drops that come and go very quickly. They are limited drops. So yeah, you definitely want to pay attention. If you get on their newsletter, though, they'll send you some warning and notifications about when it's going to happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very, very cool. Um, Okay. Now it's time for the end step yeah. where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Rachel, do you have anything cool to talk about? God, it's been so much magic lately. <laughs> yeah, we just got back from uh, from Philly. Okay, here's one. Yeah. So f- in Philly, yeah. Philadelphia, one yeah. of the things, I don't know if you saw Game Nights Live yet, but uh, one of the things Philadelphia is most known for mm-hmm. is cheesesteaks. Yeah. And uh, we did a cool thing where there's these two places that are kind of the most two famous places in Philadelphia for cheesesteaks. I know Philadelphia residents, um, you know, they're like, those are tourist traps and you should go to, and then they'll name off, each one of them will name a different place. Yeah, but it's 80 Pat's miles and, from the hotel and you're like, yeah, I can't get to it's that. It's Pat's and Geno's. These mm-hmm. are the two places. And if you watch like a Philadelphia Eagles football game, they'll always do a story about Pat's and Geno's. You know, it's just, I've seen them on TV over the years. Kind of like any any sporting event that's happening in Seattle, you're going to see them throw that fish at Pike's Place Market. And there's, yeah. So anyway, uh, a bunch of us got to go to Pat's one night 
and then Gino's the other night. I don't know Uh-oh. if you got to have both. I didn't. I had no Philly cheesesteaks. Oh my gosh, not the whole time? No. Okay. Well, I didn't eat a whole lot, though. I was really bad. <laughs> no, that's good to not yeah, eat a whole yeah. lot. I ate way too much. I was really bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. how I felt about but it. What was your conclusion? Okay, well, oh boy, I'm going to probably get yelled at. Yeah, but yeah, I get... had both of them. Uh-huh. And um, there was like five or six of us that went both nights. Yeah. There was bigger groups both nights, but the five of us or six of us overlapped. And I think the consensus among us was that we liked Pat's a little bit better than Gino's. Ooh. Yeah. I Listen, if if you disagree, and I know a lot of people from Philly were, when we went to Pat's, were like, you should have gone to Gino's. And if I, you know, when I posted about Gino's, they were like, Pat's is way better. So. Same. It's, they it, were both really good. I got to say that, first of all. Yeah, it's you a did Philly the like, whole whiz and the cheese whiz and stuff? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. It gives me... The, I, I, I see it and my stomach is just like, you will die. It was... Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> I have such a delicate tummy, I can't handle anything. So I was like, I, if I have this for lunch, I will not be able to function at the, at the rest of the <laughs> convention. And let me just say, you, that would have been the outcome. Yeah, yeah. yeah, my stomach wasn't super happy, but I, you know, I, I gritted though. my teeth and got through it. Yeah. That's so fun. So that's what I would say. If you go to Philly, I would try them both and just let us know yeah. uh, which one you prefer. And if you're from Philly, let us know that we went to a tourist trap and that's not where we should go. I get it. Right. Uh, yeah. Or which one you like better. Next time. <laughs> Next time. When I have when I have my evenings for being off. <laughs> yeah, it's when you know that like, oh, I have tomorrow off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can just like chill in the hotel the rest of the day, which wasn't the case when we were there. All right, let's go to the cleanup step and say thank you to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Thank you to Craig Lanchette, Damon Lentz, Arthur Metacroft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Garav Galati, Jamie Block, Mitch Trafford, Evan Limburger, Gabriel Pozos, <gasps> Megan Yip, Larry Lem, and... Jimmy Wong. Thanks for listening, guys. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. See you next time. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com. Or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>